Members, the right honourable the Lord Mayor. City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, 30th of May 2017. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. The Council public meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and a visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. The red light to my right indicates that the meeting is being filmed and streamed. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to their elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge they are of continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt and continuous parklands, which is recognised in the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. I ask that you remain standing in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Thank you, members. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please be seated. <laughs> members, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the meeting of the City of Adelaide on Tuesday, the 30th of May, 2017. Members, we have one um, apology, which is uh, Councillor Philip Martin, who will not be joining us this evening. Otherwise, we have a full complement of members. Welcome, members. Nice to see you. Uh, I will take you on to item six, members. We have the minutes from uh, two meetings, from the 16th of May 2017 and also the 22nd of May 2017. Noting, members, in the minutes from the meeting dated the 27th of May 2017, there was a uh, small change which I'll ask you to reflect uh, when you uh, move to adopt these. Is that Councillor Sandy Vershaw uh, was not an apology for that meeting. Councillor Sandy Vershaw was in fact on leave and I'd like the minutes to reflect that please. So when you move this motion you'll be reflecting it with that in mind. So we have two sets of minutes to adopt. Can I look to the floor please members? Councillor Clearhand, seconded by Councillor Corbell. Any debate about the minutes of those two meetings members? We don't. Summing up, Councillor Clarahan, to the vote, those in favour of adopting, carried. Thank you very much, members. Members, item seven on your agenda, which is uh, public forums and deputations. Uh, I have received a deputation request from Dr WJ uh, Dolman, uh, who I will soon invite to the uh, podium uh, to share with us. Uh, regarding the uh, Dardanelles monument matter. Uh, members, I had three other deputations which I've in fact declined and members, I customarily will decline uh, deputation requests as much as we welcome them but if they do come in after the prescribed time, uh, which is late on a Friday afternoon, I will tip, uh, customarily decline them unless it is the <coughs> will of the chamber otherwise. So can I invite Dr uh, Walter Dolman, if I could please, uh, to speak to us and then <coughs> Councillor Wilkinson we can address the other matter.
Doctor, welcome to the uh, Council Chamber of the City of Adelaide. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Councillors, I'm the grandson of Colonel Walter Dolman, who was the pre-war mayor of the City of Ali and the commander of the South Australian 27th Battalion in the Dardanelle Peninsula on the, uh, on the month of September 1915. Colonel Dolman was also president of the RSL and a member of the Wattle Day League, which erected the memorial gardens in the South Park lands, which were unveiled by Governor, the Governor-General on the 7th of September 1915. Tonight I wish to argue that the proposed relocation of the cenotaph away from Park 21 onto the pavements of Kintour Avenue is inappropriate for a number of reasons. These primarily relate to the accepted importance of context to the value of any work of art, which includes, of course, monuments and memorials. Firstly, the social context. The memorial gardens were conceived as a patriotic gesture, time to coincide with the annual Wattle Day of 1915. Funding was through public subscription by the women of the Wattle Day League, which uh, found support in, uh, by local artisans and businesses, and was inspired by the families of those troops then serving South Australia in the Middle East. There were two South Australian battalions engaged in the campaign. The 10th Battalion, the Adelaide Battalion, sometimes known, sometimes known as the uh, Adelaide Rifles, which was withdrawn in September, and the 27th Unley Battalion, sometimes known as the Boothbury Regiment, which remained there until the final withdrawal. The memorial's location is therefore highly significant in that it was cited for access by mothers and families of the soldier from both the city of Unley and the city of Adelaide. The military context. What we now call Park 21 was regularly used for training and military parades from as early as 1885. Artillery training also regularly occurred on this site and the rifle range was just to the east of the monument and that's where the Ville Gardens now stand. The monument therefore establishes a strong and symbolic link between the military training of South Australians who went to war and the formal memory of their achievements and sacrifice. Other closer connections to World War I are the adjacent uh, AIF Memorial Cemetery, the World War I Hospital, which we now know as Keswick Barracks, and of course Anzac Highway, down the centre of which are trees representing the fallen soldiers. Uh, these were planted by school children just after the war, one of them being my father. The legal context. Neither council nor state provided any funding for the memorial or the cenotaph. Archive memos between the then town clerk of the City of Adelaide and the head gardener describe a contract with the Wattle Day League whereby all costs associated with the construction were to be borne by the WDL and that council would assume responsibility for subsequent maintenance. This contractual arrangement indicates that ownership of the cenotaph remained with the Wattle Day League and did not pass to the Adelaide City Council nor the State Government. The Wattle Day League is now represented as the Wattle Day Association. The Wattle Day Association recently has formally petitioned against the uh, current proposal for relocation. The context of living history. The memorial and monument in Park 21 has continually been used for subsequent remembrance. For many years, ceremonies were held at the monument and plantings conducted to honour VC winners, including Sergeant Inwood, who was a City of Adelaide employee, as well as the women of the Ambulance Corps and others. It has also provided a focal point over the years for the families and now the grandchildren of the soldiers from Adelaide and Unley to quietly reflect and to remember. The context of the cenotaph is integral to the memorial. The monument and memorial gardens were designed by Walter to Road to symbolise Gallipoli. The uncut blocks of granite represent the rugged hills up which the Australian soldiers had to climb. The flat stone at the apex was meant to denote an achievement, a victory. A cross made from beach pebbles taken from, the, from Gallipoli was added later. The garden structure was very significant. In laying out the ground, posts at the front were four feet apart. There were four quadrants and four pathways, each representing the fourth of the month, April of course. Uh, and in each quadrant were 25 wattle trees representing the 25th of the month. In the footpath there were six spaces for trees representing the Australian states. The orientation was to greet the morning sun. The monument was always conceived for a garden arbor setting, hence one of the reasons for its location in the South Park land. The monument, should, the monument should continue to enjoy its open space. 
In October 1940, the monument and its arbor were relocated only a short distance within the same park, Park 21, uh, onto its current site by the Adelaide City Council. Services are still held at the monument to mark its anniversary and new ceremonial wattle trees have been planted. The mourning and sadness of local families is linked to both of these adjacent spots. It is therefore a special if not sacred site and must be protected against desecration. The proposed stone footpath site on Kinter Avenue represents the antithesis of the peaceful garden setting envisioned by the Wattle Day League and its families. Like centuries, five of the pines representing the state still stand on the original site and are in good health. Doctor, I apologise to interject. I'll afford you a little more time, but I will need you to begin to sum up. Um, I'll do that. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Descendants of the ceremonial wattles remain nearby. If there is to be any move, surely it should be back to where the memorial was originally conceived, a stone throw away from where it is now, and accompanied by a reconstruction of the timber arbour to again make the memorial complete. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you kindly, Dr. Domin. Um, and Dr. Domin, this matter is being uh, considered by the Council Chamber at item 15.5. I will endeavour to bring that item forward on the agenda. Uh, uh, members, I may do this as uh, the first item of motions on notice. So we uh, have five motions on notice this evening in your papers. I might bring this item forward to be the first one. So, now members, I had uh, deputation requests from David Farber, Kathleen Newerhead Kern, and Kelly Henderson, of which I've rejected all, and I would stand firm on that unless I have an express different will from the Chamber. So I don't. So, Councillor Wilkinson. Okay, members, uh, procedurally, I would need to see a show of hands with a clear majority in order for uh, that decision to be reversed. Because then I've been informed that there actually need to be a motion. Lord, could we be given some indication of what the um, people wish to speak about? Certainly. My understanding is that uh, the. Thank you, Dr. Dolman. Much appreciated. Uh, Dr. David Farber, Kathleen Newerhead Kerr, and Kelly Henderson, I understand, were all regarding the same matter. Okay, members, thank you. I will keep the, without further ado, I'll keep the, moving, the meeting moving. So thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Much appreciated. Lord Mayor, should you have not allowed question time for anyone that wanted to ask questions of the Doctor? Yes, of course. I apologise, Councillor Rabia. Uh, does anyone have a question for the, uh, Dr. Dolman? And if so, I'll invite the Doctor back to the podium. Okay, Dr. Dolman, I apologise. Please rejoin us. I'm sorry about that. Councillor Clarehan. Uh, my question was, was uh, any committee consulted uh, when the monument was moved? Did you say in 1941? In, in, in 1940. Um, there was concern in 1940 that the gardens had fallen into some disrepair. Uh, Colonel Dolman uh, wrote several uh, petitions to council to try and have that corrected. Um, the response was that the council decided to move the monument, but I don't believe without any uh, endorsement, certainly not by the RSL. The RSL opposed the uh, relocation to its current site. Uh, I don't believe the Wattle Day League uh, was consulted either, as they have not been consulted on the current uh, uh, exercise. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Corbell. Thank you. Um, does the memorial have any connection to the 10th, 27th Battalion, the Royal South Australian Regiment? Uh, absolutely. The current 10th, 27th uh, um, Battalion is the uh, derivative, I suppose, of these two original battalions. It's combined now into one battalion, so the 10th and the 27th are effectively the current South Australian Regiment. So there's a direct line to the current, uh, current battalion, yes. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. One supplementary question. Certainly. Is there any connection between um, the Wattle League and the 10th 27th? Uh, indirectly. Um, Colonel Dolman, as I said, was Mayor of Unley. He was commander of the 27th. He was also very active in the Wattle Day Association and president of the RSL. So all those bodies sort of come together, I suppose, in, uh, in the original impetus. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Maloney. Thank you. I've just got a, a, a genuine question out of curiosity and I thank you for your deputation and I understand the history and the connection and what you're talking about. 
I just wondered your opinion on the fact that if it was relocated to Anzac Walk, is there any consideration to the thought that that would um, expose it to more people and give more people great opportunity to, to see the memorial? Can I just get your mm. insights into that? Well, well yes, that could, that could be argued, but also I could there'd be a counter argument that it's more exposed to vandalism, that it was designed to be in a park setting, and to have memorial services uh, in the current park is not difficult. To have a memorial service on the sloping hill of Kintour Avenue, I think, would be extremely difficult. So I, I don't envisage future memorial services associated with that particular memorial because it just wouldn't be feasible alongside the beeping stoplight in Kintour, Kintour Avenue. Um, I think a lot of people have been to South Terrace to see it. I don't think it's a great distraction for people to to go to South Terrace to see it. Um, I, this is a very personal opinion, and uh, I, I could be shot down for saying this, but uh, as, a, as a historian uh, and a military historian, I think we're starting to suffer a little bit from memorial, military memorial fatigue in that little precinct. Um, and uh, people might be forgiven for coming to Adelaide to think that we are only capable of military memorials as public art. Um, I, I'm, I'm a bit concerned that we're cramming all that memorial activity into one space, uh, such a prominent space as well. But that's my personal opinion uh, um, as well. Thank you, Councillor Lani. <coughs> Councillor Clarehan. Um, thank you. And just further to that point, are you aware of the connect any connection between this memorial and the memorial in the AIF section of West Terrace, which I understand was the first cross of sacrifice in Australia? Uh, I am aware of the first cross of sacrifice. I'm not aware of a direct link, uh, as this memorial, of course, is unique in that it was uh, probably unique anywhere because it was actually built while the battle was still on. I'm not aware of any other memorial uh, except possibly the oak tree, which is part planted alongside Adelaide Oval by the same organisation, the Wattle I'm not aware of any other memorial which actually put in place while the battle was still underway. Um, so it is unique from that point of view. And a final question, Councillor Corbell. Sorry, you might have mentioned this already. Were, were, you, um, were you consulted, or was the Wattle Day, to your knowledge, the Wattle Day League um, consulted in any way by the Council Administration in regards to its movement? Uh, the, the, what has said, the, the Wattle Day Association has taken over from the Wattle Day League as the derivative. Uh, there was no direct representation to the Wattle Day Association, but the Wattle Day Association became aware and put a submission into the state government opposing the relocation. Thank you, members. Thank you, Doctor. It's greatly yes. appreciated. Members, item eight. We have no public forums this evening, members. So when we uh, item eight on your agenda is petitions, of which we have no petitions. So I'll take you straight on to item nine. Item 9.1, members, uh, you have advice from the Adelaide Park Haines Authority and reports of other committees. In this case, it is the Reconciliation Action Plan. So, members, you have a recommendation before you. Do I have a mover, Councillor Clarehan? Your mover is printed, Councillor. Seconded by Councillor Vershaw. Councillor Clarehan, would you wish to speak to the matter? Councillor Vershaw? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'll hold on. Appreciate Councillor Short, members, to the floor. Any questions, queries, or debate? Councillor Clarehan. Now I can sum up. You can sum up now, Councillor Clarehan. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry item 9.1. Thank you, members. Members, item 10 on your agenda, which is a uh, presiding member's report in the first instance uh, from the Lord Mayor. I'll read this to you, members. 27th of April, we hosted the annual reception to mark the birthday anniversary of Colonel William Light. Always a great celebration, members. Thank you for your attendance and support. 28th of April is the Lady Mayoress's Golf Day, and the 29th of April is the Lord Mayor's Golf Day at the North Adelaide Golf Course. Councillor Sandy Wilkinson, thank you for your magnificence on the golf course. Well done. Uh, 28th of April, I had the great honour on behalf of Council, with support from Deputy Lord Mayor uh, Hender, bestowing the keys to the City of Adelaide to the Adelaide Crows Women's Premiership Team. 
at a ceremony in the Queen Adelaide Room, as well as that same evening taking part in the installation of the new Anglican Archbishop, Geoffrey Smith. 30th of April, I attended the unveiling of the restored pioneer colonists' portrait mosaics uh, at the uh, State Library of South Australia. On the 2nd of May, I opened the Community Culture Forum at the Minor Works Building. Its purpose to provide input into the City of Adelaide cultural strategy, and thank you to Deputy Lord Mayor Megan Hender for hosting a significant portion of that summit, and to Councillors Philip Martin, Councillor Sandy Vershaw, Councillor Sandy Wilkinson also for attending. Also, the Lady Mayor S and I attended the National Trust 180th anniversary celebration of Colonel William Light's District of Adelaide survey. In the month of May, I hosted the Lord Mayor's Pressing Forum and the Lord Mayor's Business Forum. 20th of May, Lord Mayor's Commercial, uh, Lord Mayor's Commercial Property Owners Workshop, as proposed by Councillor Philip Martin, was attended by approximately 20 uh, City of Adelaide property owners. I believe Peter Tunno was there. Thank you very much, Peter, who's in the gallery with us today. I appreciate that the attendance of Councillors Alex Ante, Councillor Natasha Maloney, Councillor, Councillor Hussam Abiyad, Councillor Philip Martin and Councillor Sandy Wilkinson at that event. 25th of May, Bioenergy Breakfast and the biggest morning tea event for Cancer Council of Australia uh, held at the Darling Building on, um, in fact, on the roof of the heritage listed Darling Building on Franklin Street. Which have, if you haven't seen that building, members, I do encourage you to uh, contact administration who I'm sure could work with the owner for a tour. Uh, it's a magnificent restoration. On the 26th of May, I attended the National Sorry Day event at Tartan Yunga and officially opened the new 115 King William Street commercial office building with the owner, Greg Hicks. The Lady Mayoress and I also addressed the Australia Indonesia Youth Association of South Australia at the University of Adelaide to discuss the importance of internationalising Adelaide's economy and growing relationships between Indonesia and South Australia. Last week, I had the pleasure of welcoming delegates of the second Australian Smart last night, should I say members, uh, and also this morning. Uh, I had the pleasure of welcoming delegates of the second Australian Smart Communities Conference, which is uh, being held at the Adelaide Convention Centre, uh, and uh, with more than a dozen mayors from around Australia and a number from Europe in attendance. We uh, launched the Carbon Neutral Partnership Program last night, uh, whereby 40 Adelaide businesses uh, have signed on to the program to work towards carbon neutral neutrality for their own commercial operations. On the 3rd of May, the Lady Mayoress launched the City Library Exhibition for Queen Adelaide to celebrate the Adelaide Libraries program during South Australia's History Festival. 5th of May, the Lady Mayoress spoke at the Royal Commonwealth Society National Conference on the topic of peace and the Commonwealth. The Lady Mayoress attended the Starlight Day at the Women's and Children's Hospital, participating in superhero cape making, and joined in the disco with the children. On the 31st of May, the Lady Mayoress will host a history festival event, which is tomorrow at the Town Hall about the life and times of Lady Molden, who was a mining mag magnate in her own right and wife of the Lord Mayor Frank Beaumont Molden. 2nd of June, Lady Maris will address a Historical Society of South Australia event uh, called Her Story for Love and Duty. Members, could I have a member move that that verbal report be accepted? Uh, thank you, Councillor Clarehan, seconded by Councillor Corbell. Those in favour, members? Thank you. Members, I have a secondary item with, with regards to my presiding member's report. Now, I understand, members, this item uh, may have been emailed to you this afternoon and it's on your desk. Now, members, this is the presiding member's report titled Recent Planning Announcements. Uh, as you may be aware yesterday, members, uh, Deputy Premier John Rao um, on Lee Street, I understand, and the Deputy Lord Mayor was there, uh, announced a number of uh, uh, changes to various planning legislation uh, notwithstanding, and not, uh, also including the 30-year plan for Greater Adelaide, the Capital City Design Quality DPA, North Adelaide, Large Institutions and Colleges DPA, uh, former Channel 9 Site DPA, uh, Heritage Places Institutions and Colleges DPA with interim effect, and a number of other matters which probably have more statewide significance. So, members, that is a uh, for your information report which um, uh, we asked to be distributed to you today by administration. So could I please have a member move that for noting? Councillor Wilkinson, seconded by 
Councillor Milani, any debate members? I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour to note, those against, we carry. Thank you very much, members. And that concludes item 10. So, members, I will move you on without further ado to item 11.1. Uh, we have a report, which is uh, reports from councillors. Uh, members, could I have a mover? Could I have a seconder, please, members? So moved by Councillor Bershaw, seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. Members, before I put that to the vote, does any individual member like to speak to their report or their activities over the last month? Councillor Bershaw? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Just very quickly, um, I went to the new Centre of Democracy on the weekend, uh, which sadly I didn't know existed. Um, and it's in the entry to the old institute building on Kintore, the corner of Kintore North Terrace. Um, and they've done a fabulous job and um, lots of historical artefacts as well as digital interpretation. And I would just implore everybody to go and have a look when you've got some time. Um, they've done a really lovely job and the, all the displays and everything will be changing. The, the um, display that pertains to the City of Adelaide uh, is a registry from the 1800s which shows the first female vote at a local election. Um, and so it's, it was a lovely, lovely thing to do. Thank you. Thank you and well said, Councillor. I visited it also on Sunday and saw the Venerable Robert Sims on the, uh, on the wall. Yes. Members, any other further discussion? So Councillor Vershaw has moved to adopt, so I'll put that to the vote. Those in favour? Those against, we carry. Thank you very much, members, which takes us on to item 12 on your agenda, members. Our first item is item 12.1, which is page eight of your papers, which is outdoor dining transition plan. You have a recommendation before you, members. Do I have a mover? Councillor Abiyan? Sorry, now I don't support the recommendation and I wanted to come, I'm happy to have someone else move it and I'll move an amendment or, Happy to have a chat about it, whatever you suit. Uh, you can, I mean, your hands, Councillor, you can move an alternate motion or you can have another mover. Another mover can move the recommendation and then you can amend your decision. Happy someone else to move, Lord Mayor. Happy okay. to debate it a little bit more, give it more time. Noted, Councillor. Councillor Vershaw, are you moving as printed, Councillor? You are? So do I have a seconder to Councillor Vershaw who is moving as printed? Councillor Clarehan. So, Councillor Vershaw, the floor is yours. Reserving your right. Councillor Clarehan, you seconded? I'm happy to reserve my right. Okay, I'm going to look to Councillor Aviard who foreshadowed. Councillor Aviard. Well, Lord Mayor, I want to speak against it first. Um, Look, Lord Mayor, this is always a very tough topic. One of the main issues I've got with this is not the first, there are some aspects in the first part which are an issue, uh, especially around uh, item 8.2. There's a lot of ambiguity um, around if the business undergoes a change of owner, does that mean if the business is sold, we can just waltz in there and remove any outdoor fixed furniture. Um, the business closes for any period of time and the furniture is left on a footpath is that just overnight? Is that a week? Is that three months? Uh, there's a lot of issues with this report, Lord Mayor, and issues also to do with council legacy. I cannot justify going back to our ratepayers and businesses and asking them to pay more money for outdoor dining, fixed furniture to go up from $5 per square metre to $15 per square metre, three times more for fixed furniture, for something they've done for, for nothing. They've done nothing wrong. These were approved to them in the past. As far as these businesses are concerned, they've done everything right to date. Now, council comes and changes this policy. If we need to find money to be able to cost this so we can remove fixed furniture, we need to find that money in our own budget. We can't go change the, uh, change the map, change the plans and the policy on current businesses and expect them to pay three times more for fixed furniture um, for the outdoor dining uh, of the city. Endorses the waiving of the outdoor dining permit fees for the first 12 months for businesses applying for new outdoor dining premises. 
That's fine. I remain and I remain quite focused on this and a big issue for me personally. I would like to see all outdoor dining fees waived for everyone in the city of Adelaide. We need to fix the legacy problems. I agree 100 percent. And those leg legacy issues have to be they have to be borne by a council. Uh, this is a legacy problem for us. It's a policy problem for us. Uh, a few years back, Lord Mayor, these were approved. Uh, so I, I would like to, if there's an opportunity to do so, uh, for either one, one of two things. I'm happy to move a motion on now to pretty much delete some of those items or to defer this item, Lord Mayor. I'll probably go down that path and I'll seek a seconder to defer this item so we could revisit it and look at different ways and possibly even go to a consultation process with the business to work out what works and doesn't work. But this year is penalising hospitality businesses a little bit. So I'd move a deferral and I'd seek a secondary at this stage. Okay, so that's effectively an amendment to defer. Councillor Antic had his hand up first, Councillor Milani. So you have a seconder and the time starts again, I think. So you can speak to as to why you believe a deferral will be the I think the deferral is important, Lord Mayor, because on daily basis I've been asked from hospitality businesses, what is happening to the fee? What can we do what we can't do? To go back to them with a solution which basically says if you have fixed furniture on your footpath which have complied for years and years and years and years, now we're going to charge you three times, which is a penalty, unless you remove those furniture at your own cost. Uh, that's very unacceptable. I agree that there's a cost there to be borne, but that cost cannot be borne by the ratepayers. It has to be by the City of Adelaide, because we have decided to change the policy. It's a terrible policy, allowing such infrastructure on public space, in, in, for example, to give an example, in the case of Alfonso or some of the installations on Rundle Street is an issue. But a previous council have supported those decisions. And for us to come now and ask those ratepayers to pay the price for, that's very unfair, Lord Mayor. I'd like to be able to see more detail um, in the um, in the items um, in item eight, especially around how and when um, and what is borne by council and what isn't. Um, I would also, and that's purely me, and I'm not sure what the appetite of council would be. I still would urge to not to go down the line of a change of policy of not charging for outdoor dining fees in the City of Adelaide, but that might be a debate for another day. Uh, but today, I cannot support this motion, and in saving it, I think it's preferable that we defer it, deal with the items that I've discussed, especially around the application of three times the rates for um, per square metre for fixed furniture, and then bring it back to Council for a final decision. Councillor Abia, for the benefit of your fellow members, you're looking to defer this item to do what with it? Yes, so to, we're deferring this item, Lord Mayor, to revisit and to consult with businesses, hospitality businesses, on what we're proposing. Because I believe what we're proposing is very unfair. Okay, thank Would you. Would you like me to defer it to committee? Is that enough for you? I would consultation. encourage you, uh, Councillor Abia, that should this be deferred for consultation, right. which is entirely your right, that then that possibly be brought back to a committee if you feel that's appropriate, and then into the chamber. But that's, I think the right, that's the right. Members, question. this matter has been bouncing around the chamber for some time, and it should be resolved. Thank you. So, that's thank good. you. Now, the CEO might want to make a comment. Now I'm going to go to the second who is Councillor Antic. Then I'm going to go to Councillor Milani. CEO. Through you, Lord Mayor, just to remind Council that the report has been prepared following a detailed conversation and workshop. Um, it is entirely appropriate if Council wishes to defer. There is no time sensitivity with this report. Um, and it may, may well be that you may, may wish to note the report, but require administration to consult on the content of the report before bringing it back to Council. That might be a way forward for you to give you more comfort. But just to, re just to explain once again, the report was drafted directly as a result of the conversation that was occurred through Council at the workshop. Okay, uh, Councillor Antic, you seconded. Would you wish to speak? Okay, Councillor Mulaney. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I was going to pick up on the point the CEO made. We have we have workshop this, and, and I guess one of the um, queries I had and why I support the deferral is I, I fully recognise this is complex and we've had the debate. However, my view is in that debate, we and, and uh, there was no policy on this, so we're starting 
from a, a messy space to get a policy in place. It's always harder when we when we start in that environment. But my recollection from the workshop conversation is that there is going to be examples where the transition from fixed furniture to removable furniture is going to be on a customised case by case basis. So the reason I don't support this, the reason I want to workshop more, is it just lacks flexibility for me. I know we have to enter this space, I get that, but this to me is too much red tape in this, in this, for this policy. This policy has to have a way more space given for transition in terms of time, rules and the costing. So I know we have to put a policy around this, we've got to do it, but I just think that there is a lack of flexibility and customisation required. Let's take the line Hotel, for example, and the conversation you have with someone like them versus an, another sort of cafe owner. The, um, and and the, um, the premise opposite it is about to be tenanted with fixed furniture. It's part of the offering. The, so there has to be some customisation around the conversation um, and how we deal with these fixed furniture um, scenarios. And I just don't think this is a transition plan. It's a very hard line in the sand. I think we need to just give it some more consideration. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Mullaney. Deputy Lord Mayor, followed by Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, Lord Mayor, I can't support the amendment, um, although I might have supported just a plain old deferral to committee so that we can have a bit more of a discussion about it. But as the amendment stands, it's deferred to revisit and consult with hospitality businesses on the proposal. And I think we've been doing a lot of consultation. We've been out marching the streets, talking to businesses about their specific circumstances and how this would impact on them. So I think our consultation has been significant and I'm not keen to do that again. Um, so I've got, I've got a question before I make some additional remarks. If this matter is deferred, um, I'm just, well, first of all, if it was just deferred to committee, when would it first come back to committee? When would be the first opportunity for it to come back to committee? See ya. Get through Lord Mayor. I understand we could have a, a, a discussion uh, at the workshop next Tuesday, a, a short discussion, but we may need to reschedule for a detailed discussion and that could be a, a couple of months. Okay, so I, I, uh, and uh, another question about the impact of this given that we're just about to move into a new financial year fairly soon, what's, the, um, what's going to be the impact if we don't have a new policy in place? Claire Mopla, thanks. Uh, through the presiding member, um, the fees were waived for outdoor dining for this financial year only, um, and the draft budget as it currently stands reinstates those fees. That was my recollection. So look, I can't support it as it currently stands. I would support just a simple deferral so that people could have the discussion if they wanted to have a further discussion. Should I, I'd also like to um, just indicate that um, and foreshadow, I guess, if this doesn't get up and we go back to the original motion, my intention was to um, introduce an extra paragraph, um, uh, which is, and I'll give you that information now just to give you a heads up, um, that uh, we note that the administration will work with large hotels and pubs with fixed outdoor dining, outdoor dining furniture when a transition is triggered to determine on a case-by-case -case basis whether a transition to removable furniture is practical, taking into account public and staff safety, operating hours, <coughs> storage issues, the size of outdoor dining area and any other relevant considerations. Now that um, paragraph has been drafted by the administration. It was already their intention, although I don't think it was as apparent, it certainly wasn't apparent to me on reading of the, on the, reading of the report. Um, their intention is to treat particularly hotels who have much longer trading hours than the odd, you know, cafe for example, to, um, to treat them with uh, in, a, in a different way and as an example, um, the Stag Hotel, as I understand it, has recently negotiated with Council to put in new fixed outdoor dining because they've upgraded it and been able to convince our staff that it's in the interests of the city and the business that they be allowed to put fixed furniture there as opposed to removable furniture. So what our staff, I think, is trying to indicate is that they are taking a flexible approach, a case-by-case -case approach where it's required, um, and that I'd like that flexible approach actually built into the transition plan so that it's much more explicit within the transition plan and people understand that that's what, what is the case. I, I also think there's a point that could be made that just as we have an encroachment policy, there are opportunities where people want to argue 
uh, against, uh, argue that their circumstances fall outside the encroachment policy that they can bring it, potentially bring it to council and say this is a this is a different set of circumstances um, and we we would like to be considered in a different way. We understand it's not in accordance with your policy and give them an opportunity to, to um, argue it in. So um, that would be the amendment I'd um, foreshadow if the uh, deferral motion doesn't get up. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Wilkinson, you're speaking to the amendment. Uh, yes, I um, uh, won't support the amendment. I'd, I would support what Councillor, the Deputy Lord Mayor, is talking about with her amendment as well. I think um, the discussion with the administration sounds eminently sensible. I can think of examples myself, the Austral Hotel, with its tiled seat on Yonge Street, from the fixed um, tables at the Lion Hotel. Um, and the new seat has been done at the stag as a beach type seating and, and it's not the sort of lone table thing and, and if we had had this policy in place sooner um, then uh, we wouldn't get the situation where as Councillor Milani refers to directly opposite the line where the property is being re-offered with the fixed tables as part of the offering whereas if we had this policy in place we could have seized on that opportunity got rid of all those fixed tables and then when the new regime comes in, so now that's, that opportunity has been lost. And 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 Councillor uh, Abia referred to the rate you know, being tripled. Well, it's going from one thruppence a day to three thruppence a day compared to the internal rent that these properties are paying. It's an absolute peppercorn rent that is being charged. So it's three peppercorns rather than one peppercorn. So, uh, I think the administration thing is eminently fair and it needs to be some motivation for people to transition from fixed furniture to uh, non-fixed furniture. If it's so cheap, why would you bother why would you bother getting rid of your fixed furniture if there's no no cost penalty um, associated, which is what it sounds like Councillor Albert is seeking to achieve, which I think would achieve nothing. So I for sure I'd support the second the Deputy Lord Mayor's amendment if this is lost. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Members, no further debate. I will take this back to Councillor Slami. You'd like to speak to the proposed amendment, which is to defer. Yeah, yeah I will. I don't support the deferral um, because I don't support any other consultation. I think we're making a very simple process and issue very complicated again. Um, in fact, if and if. if uh, it doesn't get deferred. I foreshadow an amendment to take on Councillor um, Deputy Lord Mayor Hender's um, paragraph plus the deletion of point four and the deletion of first 12 months in point five. Okay, thank you for registering your intent, uh, Councillor Slava. Thank you. Now, members, without any further debate, I hand you back to Councillor Abiyad to discuss the amendment to defer. Councillor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, mainly here, I, mean, I don't know what consultation has been done, but in me speaking to a lot of businesses, uh, they are finding that this process is a little bit unfair and of no fault of theirs. We are going back to them. So we talk about a budget impact and all the discussion here that I see from administration, and look, I'm never critical of administration, but in this case, we're referring to all the stuff as revenue, as money we're bringing in as a result of permits. These businesses are already doing a hard in our city. We have an increase in hospitality business, an increase in competition. They contribute to our vibrancy in the city. To go and add to the bottom line a three-time expense, and so Councillor Wilkinson, it might be pittance because of whatever salary he makes, but to these people, every dollar matters. When you're changing a permit from $500 to $1,500 a year, that impacts your net revenue return for that business. It means more coffee sales. It means less staffing. It means less money you take home. These things have an impact on business. And I, for one, stood for this council to cut down red tape and to minimise cost of business. We are basically saying in this policy, Lord Mayor, that we're going to go back and charge three times more for no reason, as a penalty. So maybe they feel the pain and they remove it. I prefer the carrot approach for us to go to those businesses and say, look, this was not your fault. Those outdoor fixed furnitures, that, that's not your fault. We have a fund. Are you prepared to contribute 50% to new outdoor dining if we also give you a little bit of money? That's the approach council should take. And I would support Councillor Slammer's motion in removing item four. I think that's definitely a big one for me there. 
um, and also uh, the 12 month, and with the addition of whatever the Lord, uh, the Lord Mayor proposed, I don't have a problem with that either. But look, I'd urge members to consider the hospitality businesses we are adding an impact on in this specific case. This policy is designed to penalise those businesses, not to reward them, not to work with them to get a good outcome. And that's the problem I have with it, and especially item four, and especially especially the lack of clarity around item eight in our in our policy. So I'd ask members to support the deferral and to consult with the businesses impacted and get that response back. And if not, we've got a possible amendment from Councillor Islama to, to hopefully debate and discuss. Members, you have a amendment to defer before you. Those in favour? Those against? The amendment to defer fails, so we go back to the substantive, which was the recommendation at this point in time as moved by Councillor Vershaw. Deputy Lord Mayor, you foreshadowed first, so the floor is yours. So Lord Mayor, I move as printed, um, but with the additional paragraph that I dictated previously becoming the new paragraph two. Do you want me to dictate it again? Okay, so dear Lamb, we've already it's already been moved as printed, so you're moving to Sorry, amend I'm the substantive. To, yeah, make your okay, Sorry. I'll just have you read that out and then I'll uh, take the second of so uh, Councillor Wilkinson that will give the members the benefit of reading what you're going to do first. So uh, that the administration will work with large hotels and pubs, as a, this is a new paragraph two, um, with fixed outdoor dining furniture when a transition is triggered to determine on a case by case basis whether a transition to removable furniture is practical taking into account public yes. and staff safety. DLM, can I please encourage you to slow down? We're having Sorry. a little problem <laughs> keeping, up, keeping up with you. Case by case basis, whether a transition to removable furniture is practical, taking into account public and staff safety, operating hours, storage issues, the size of the outdoor dining area, and any other relevant considerations. Okay, DLM, can you please check your screen in front of you? Okay, we're just going to confirm that your wording is accurate to what you are. Now, is that the only part of the recommendation which you're seeking to amend? No, to, well, we would uh, also amend. like to um, amend. Uh, well, sorry, paragraph two will then become a new paragraph three, and and um, and the numbering uh, will um, follow. Uh, and then in paragraph, what is currently paragraph, or what what in the original motion was paragraph four, and now becomes the new paragraph five. I changed that to ten dollars per square metre. Yeah. Sorry, I need a second apology on the run alert. <laughs> okay, you have a seconder in Councillor Wilkinson who had his hand up first. Councillor Wilkinson, is this what you're seconding? Is this what you had your hand up to do? <coughs> it's the question of the administration. I thought the current fee was twenty two dollars a square meter. Seven this is an additional cost for fixed oh, oh, right, I see. Yeah. Okay. I'm happy to run with that then. Yeah. Okay, so Councillor Wilkinson, you are the seconder. Uh, DLM, would you like to speak to your uh, this matter? And then I'll look to your seconder, then I'll look to Councillor Malani. So Lord Mayor, I'm, um, I think I've already made the point to some extent, and that is what I'm trying to do is actually articulate what is act it's already um, included in paragraph 12. Um, uh, but is not, I think, uh, articulated, or certainly I didn't pick it up. So it's just making explicit what was already um, included in the report, that the, um, the administration does seek uh, and is intending to continue to seek to work with individual business owners to make sure that this is not a draconian measure for them. Um, I also um, uh, do, do just want to point out that this, this additional fee, this, this charge that we're placing, this outdoor, um, fixed outdoor dining fee, but the, this, the fee only applies to 
fixed furniture, the additional fee only applies to fixed furniture. There's a standard cost for any outdoor dining and it's in the vicinity of 32, I think, or 30. Um, it's in, in, in any event, it's in the report. There's $34. A, um, a, uh, 34 for ordinary businesses, 39 for businesses per square metre for businesses in the central activity in main streets. And what we're talking about is, in, is adding an additional, in, if you accept my amendment, an additional $10 to that for outdoor, for fixed furniture, just to make the point that we treat fixed furnishings differently than we do movable furniture. It's not supposed to be a penalty, it's really just making the point. And can I draw your attention to the fact that this is $10 per square metre per year? This is not a figure that's being charged for them every week or every month or every minute or every day. This is being charged per year. This is not a significant in cost. Um, particularly as some of these businesses, as um, uh, Councillor Abbey points out, have completely taken over public space and turned it into effectively private space and are using it to make a lot of money. And, and um, I understand Councillor Abbey's interest in making sure that we're not making things difficult for, for um, these businesses. But, you know, I think what we're doing by withdrawing um, the, the imposition of a fee on um, people who are using private space, sorry, public <coughs> space for private purposes, is we're advantaging one business type within the city, that is cafes, or restaurants and hotels, that, you know, that hospitality, at the expense of all of the other business types in the city. Retail, they don't get any free, free kick for their, for their premises. Um, commercial premises don't get any free kick. But we're giving, if we don't impose some sort of cost associated with, with this, we're giving a free kick to just one segment of the um, of our community without any evidence on which to base that, that that is a particular segment of the community that requires a free kick over and above any other segment of the community. And I would have actually said retail required a free kick more than cafes. I don't know. We just don't know the answer to that. Um, so, uh, I, I'm um, keen that we get on with it. We've been talking about this for an awfully long time. We need something in place for the new financial year and I urge you to support the uh, amended one. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I've got Councillor Wilkinson followed by Councillor Maloney followed by Councillor Aviad. I'm sorry, Councillor Clarahan. I will pop you in after Councillor Aviad if I can. I reserve my right. Milani. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I still won't support this, but I'm actually quite excited because I've actually seen now there's a pathway, because I suspect this might get up, where we set a policy and then we add a paragraph that kind of says, well, we're kind of going to follow it, but not really because we're going to customise it and we're going to talk to them on a case-by-case -case basis. So great, and we could do that with parking um, policy as well, and parking fines, and we could set a policy but all our customer service officers could go and have a chat to everyone they're about to find and have a conversation and talk them through it. Should I give you a fine or shouldn't I give you a fine? It's really exciting. We, we really, we're setting a policy, but at the same time, we've got a paragraph that says, yeah, but, you know, if that doesn't work for you, we'll kind of come along and have a chat with you, which is what we should be doing in the first place, rather than just setting black and white policy. So, therefore, members, I urge you, uh, can I ask a quick question? Exactly how, I can't see it in the report, exactly how many businesses are we talking about with fixed furniture? Is it four? Yeah, through the presiding member, there's 143 businesses with fixed furniture. Approximately 40 of those are pubs and hotels. We should be talking to them all, in my view. Um, my view is we should go and have a conversation, we should sit down amongst ourselves and work out really what is a good transition. We know we need a policy in this space, but this is very murky. You're not, you're not um, setting any um, rules around fixed furniture here. We're setting some maybe maybes, which is what got us into this position in the first place. So, members, I, 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 I would urge you not to support this and then we go back to the drawing board. Councillor Abiyad, followed by Councillor Clearhand. Well, similar concerns to Councillor Milani around uh, the policy's ambiguity. But look, again, most importantly, I think a lot of council members here feel like I'm some, somehow the lone wolf. 
shopping centers around the world, cities around the world, hospitality businesses, are anchor businesses. Centers like Westfield pay and subsidize hospitality businesses to enter their premises because they attract people for retail. If our city does, city does not have hospitality businesses, we do not have retail in our city. We don't have a customer experience in our city. They add value to our streets and to our neighborhoods and they do it tough. Every single one of you that goes into a coffee shop every single day, you see the owner in that shop doing 80 hour weeks. No one wants to work 80 hour weeks. I don't care how passionate you are about your business. They do it because they have no other choice. And to add a burden on them of an application fee, $350, $39 per, per square meter for central activity, a levy of another $5. We talk about cutting red tapes and we're adding levy. This is not their fault. It's not their fault that they have fixed furniture. It's a previous council's fault. It's our fault. It's our legacy problem. We need to fix it. We shouldn't penalise them. PVC blinds, again, approved in the past. $43 per linear metre. I mean, some ridiculous stuff here, Lord Mayor. I'd like to ask a question of administration. There's 143 extra businesses that we're going to be applying an extra $15 per square metre for per year. What is that equal to? And why do we need to generate extra revenue? And how are we going to use that revenue to resolve the fixed furniture problem? Uh, through the presiding member, if we, if council were to adopt the $15 per square metre for the 143 fixed businesses, it would equate to approximately $54,000 extra revenue a year. a year. And how are we planning to use that money? It would go into it goes into the general operating. Yeah, like we need more money to spend in our council on stuff that we don't need. We need another 50 grand. Why? What do we need that for? Why can't we put that $54,000 back into the hospitality and outdoor dining policy and go out and speak to people and convince them to remove their outdoor dining if that's what the council intent is? We're not a revenue collector. We're about giving a service back to the community and about spending that money in a good way. This is a penalty for no reason. This is like simply bringing back the death penalty because we feel like it. Suddenly, because someone's sitting in the court and we're going, you know what? We don't like you today, we're going to bring back the death penalty. But hey, Your Honour, we never had that before. Well, not today, we're going to bring it back. And you have to pay the price for that. It's unfair, and this is not something this council should stand for. I completely oppose this. Item 8 is still all over the place. It does not explain things in, in clarity. And I have major concerns. So look, I'd ask members to not support this, to engage better with the community, and to bring back a policy that is adopted by hospitality businesses which has a carrot approach, not one of a stick, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Abia. Councillor Clarehan, followed by Councillor Vishal. Um, Lord Mayor, I was just going to ask if the mover and seconder would be prepared to add large cafes, because in North Adelaide there are some cafes that are much larger than the hotels, and I'm very concerned that in the case of Scooty, for example, you know, put a lot of, spend a fortune on having really good quality tables made. The cabinetry, the expense was considerable. And I really wouldn't like to see a situation where um, cafes are basically given a harder time than hotels, for example. Um, and so if we're going to be customer centred, customer focused, if we're prepared to actually negotiate uh, the transition with our businesses, I think large cafes um, would, could very easily be added to that, um, to that no amendment uh, put forward by the Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, you were asked whether you would make a variation. Um, to vary. You would vary that. So do we have appropriate wording around that, Deputy Lord Mayor, to incorporate that variation into your second amendment? Add the words, large hotels, pubs and cafes. Thank you. Okay, so the All Secretary is clear on that. Agree. So what's on your screen, Deputy Lord Mayor? Does that, <coughs> does that reflect the intent? Yes, it does. Now you've got a seconder, which was uh, Councillor Wilkinson. Do you accept that variation, Councillor? 
Members, I look to the floor. Do you have comfort in that variation as proposed by Councillor Clarehan? I need a majority. Those in favour of that variation? Does that include every, all 143 now? No. How do you define large? Sorry, how do you define large? I'm sure our administration has worked that out. Oh, they can't work it out. We should do it. I can't even work it out. I'm going to refer that question from Councillor Maloney to the CEO. Yeah, it is a question. Members, please. It's a genuine question. How do you define large? Through the presiding member, we would ordinarily define large based on the outdoor dining area, the size of it. So for the largest outdoor dining area in the city at the moment is 154 square metres. So anything over 100 square metres we would consider a large outdoor dining area. Just to be clear, on this motion, anything under that won't get this um, warm welcome of custody, you know, this paragraph applied to them? We would be adopting a case-by-case -case approach, which is what the motion, I believe, tries to articulate the resolution. Sorry, Lord Mayor, I still don't have clarity. Okay, members, we need to deal with this variation. So the variation is recorded in front of you. The Deputy Lord Mayor and the seconder has approved the variation. So members, I just need to deal with that now. So those in favour of the variation so we can move on with the debate. Okay, so members, hands up for those who are supporting the variation. Okay, so the variation is carried. So Councillor Clearhand, do you have any further comment? Only to say thank you um, for varying the motion. I'm really conscious that if there are indeed some some businesses, some cafes who are actually struggling, uh, and the biggest cost impost will be those larger um, cafes with, that have perhaps six or more tables, um, and to um, it's not just about the cost of the square meterage or the number of tables. Well, it is the number of tables. Um, the more tables you've got, the greater expense because you're going to have to go out and buy quality tables to replace fixed quality tables. And some, I'm aware that some hospitality businesses and cafes are actually struggling. And I think um, you know we do need to take that into account at this time. And I think the variation will give some discretion to our staff um, to to be able to. Um, it, consult and negotiate a reasonable outcome where possible. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Veshaw. Um, Lord Mayor, I'd like to foreshadow that um, I'd like to defer to committee. Um, there is... Um, Councillor Veshaw, unfortunately you can't do that. So uh, the, this is the second amendment. A deferral is in fact an amendment. So, members, procedurally, can I share with you what plays out? If I, if I can... Um... Let, it, let it lose and... So, members, we have a uh, second amendment by the Deputy Lord Mayor. Well, you have it in front of you. You will need to debate that and decide upon that. Depending on the outcome of that, we would then defer back to the substantive and you would vote on the substantive and that would get up or fail. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yep. If it fails, then what happens? If, the, if we go back to the substantive and it fails, yes. then what happens? It's finished. We start again. So it could be uh, another motion in another part of this meeting which you might, someone, a member, may like to move. So, but what we've got before us would fail in terms of the substantive motion. Yep. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and look, I do agree with uh, several things that have been said, but obviously there's so much still playing out that I do think that this requires further discussion and, and we've had many discussions already. I don't think outdoor dining levies equate to death penalties, but I do actually agree that the levies should feed back in transition costs and um, that we should be supporting that transition in different ways. Um, the waiving of fees uh, interesting enough uh, for compliance was not an incentive. Um, as you'll see in uh, 31.2, only four businesses made minor changes so they were compliant. So, so that waiving of fees, which was 
was a carrot, was an incentive, actually wasn't incentivising. And if we were very serious about transitioning to um, to non-fixed furniture, then we actually do need to assist with the transition costs. And again, Councillor Albia uh, did say something I thought resonated in terms of us even saying, saying whether we can go 50-50 in those costs, but that the levy should feed back constantly into a fund that is utilised for that specific purpose. Having said that, I hope that this fails so that we can actually take it back to committee. Thank you, Councillor Vershaw. Councillor Antic, you had your hand up. Yeah. Councillor Vershaw has taken the words out of my mouth to a certain extent, um, which is often a good result. Um, but uh, the, uh, <laughs> uh, look, I, I, I share a lot of um, Councillor Abiyad's uh, frustration with this, uh, and not because it's not a good piece of work, but simply because of the issue of red tape, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to repeat everything that's been said. Uh, there's a fair bit of it. I, I've got some problems with um, um, some of the wording and, and some of the imposts that are put on, on businesses. So uh, I, I won't support it in this um, guise, and I probably won't support the substantive either, but I would support going to committee. But of course, the other mechanism for that is the Deputy Lord Mayor doing it. So, but um, <laughs> it's her choice. Um, so uh, we might see how we go. Thank you, members. I might speak to this matter before I hand back to the Deputy Lord Mayor to sum up. Members, I think this policy uh, is way too nuanced, and I don't think we are fully cognizant of all of the intended or unintended effects as such. My own personal position on this matter is that uh, it be deferred to a committee, not to consultation, but to a committee, whereby, members, you work through each of the recommendations that you may have before you and the information you have. You ask questions of administration. The council chamber is a difficult place for that to happen, as you know, uh, and then it be brought back to uh, council in a prompt manner, uh, whereby you are fully cognizant of all of the issues, intended or otherwise, associated with this. So, members, I must say this is a very clumsy process. It is the process we have, but uh, my recommendation would be, and the only way that can happen, and I'll explain this to you, is the Deputy Lord Mayor uh, moves. Uh, changes what she's uh, proceeding with, or this uh, second amendment gets up, and it may get up, and if it doesn't get up, it, it fails, and then we go back to the substantive, and then if that fails, we would then need someone to move it to, for that to happen. Yes. Lord Mayor, if Malani. this failed and the substantive failed and everything failed, wouldn't it just go back to a workshop, just out of interest? Uh, it would go into no man's land. I would then need a member to move for it to go somewhere which could be a fairly straightforward process. So, members, are you all clear about what's playing out in front of you and the choices that you have? Okay. So, I don't have any further comment. I'm going to go back to the Deputy Lord Mayor. We have the second amendment in front of us, which is on your screens. Deputy Lord Mayor, to sum up. So, my question, Lord Mayor, is uh, can I make a variation as enormous <laughs> as moving, <laughs> as varying my motion to defer into, so before I sum up, to defer? Okay, I'm being advised by the Secretariat that you can't. Okay. So, members, you now know the consequences. Right. Well, then I will sum up on this in the expectation that this will fail. <laughs> it's an unusual <laughs> outcome, <laughs> definitely, Lord Mayor. <laughs> members, I put this uh, Second Amendment to you for your consideration. Those in favour? <laughs> <laughs> Those against? <laughs> Okay, members, the Second Amendment has now failed. That brings us back to the substantive, which was moved originally by Councillor Vershaw and seconded by Councillor Clarehan, if my notes serve me correctly. So, we sum up. Now, we now vote on the substantive motion, which was the original recommendation in your papers, because uh, Amendment A and Amendment B have both failed. Those in favour? Those against? It fails. Members, do I have another motion? Deputy Lord Mayor had a hand up first. Can I move that the issue of outdoor dining be brought to the next available committee meeting? Do I have to move anything? Is that, is that adequate language? CEO, is that adequate language? Yes, we will do that. The reply, thanks. Okay, Councillor Bershaw, are you seconding that? You are? Any need to debate? No. Members, I look to you. Summing up, Councillor Clarehan, do you wish to speak? No, I put it to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. 
members, the CEO takes a deep sigh of relief. <laughs> And we move on. So members, I take you now to item 12.2 on, and members, thank you for your debate. I greatly appreciate it. Members, I take you to item 12.2 on your agendas. Members, I'm just going to foreshadow, I'm going to deal with item 12.2, 12.3, then I'm going to bring forward item 15.5, which is Councillor Wilkinson's motion on notice regarding the relocation of this Australasian soldiers Dardanelles Senator. Then I will continue on with our agenda as planned. Just foreshadowing members for your information. So I now have item 12.2 members. We have a recommendation to endorse. Do I have a mover? Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Clarehan. Deputy Lord Mayor, would you wish to speak to it? Yeah, Councillor Clarehan, do you wish to speak to it? No. Members, do you wish to speak to it? Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to sum up? Members, all in favour? Those against? We carry, Councillor Wilkinson, were you voting at that point in time? I didn't see a hand. You were voting in favour. Thank you, Councillor. Members, item 12.3 is again seeking a variation with regards to an encroachment. We have a recommendation from administration to endorse. I have Councillor Clarehan with a hand up, seconded by Councillor Abiyad. Councillor Clarehan. Uh, Lord Mayor, this has been almost another one of those blighted sites. It's had many applications and uh, it's been quite some time uh, since any work's been undertaken on this site. In fact, I think it's a necessity for uh, what is on there now, uh, which is incomplete, to be removed before they, it's like rubbing it out and starting again. So it would be fantastic if we could actually see um, some development happening on this site in, uh, in this uh, very small street and back lane, which also happens to be a thoroughfare. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Abia, you seconded? Uh, happens, am I right? yeah. Members to the floor. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, this site, unlike other sites, is an incredibly small site where the uh, width of the dwellings is less than four metres. We've had other developments where people have, in my view, greedily pushed their balconies over the footpath just to gain more floor space. But here, the site is such a small one that actually, um, you know, if you look at the plans there, you can see that you could not get any tighter. So, you know, I think. Um, there is justification for the encroachment in this instance, so I support this. Thank you, Councillor. Members, any further debate? I hand you back to Councillor Clarehan to sum up, who has done so. Members, those in favour of item 12.3? Those against? Councillor Abiyar, were you voting at that point in time? I voted already. Voting in favour? 12.3, carried. Members, I'm now going to take you to item 15.5. This is a motion on notice from Councillor Wilkinson. It is page 123 on your papers. Councillor Wilkinson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, members, I've put before you the motion as, uh, as in the agenda papers and um, uh, note that um, I have been provided um, from the administration the report Oh, seeking a seconder. Councillor Corbell, seconded. Councillor Wilkinson. Um, and uh, if one looks at the original reports um, that were uh, put to us, um, there was a request about moving the cenotaph to, to Kintour Avenue, and there was some background provided, but the background, um, uh, you know, perhaps for reason of limited time to repair or something like that, but nonetheless, um, the full background in terms of the significance of this cenotaph to the city of Unley, as well as the city of Adelaide, um, was, not, was not there. And that is fundamental to how this um, cenotaph came to exist, because it was put up by the battalions of the uh, 27th Battalion from Adelaide and the 10th Battalion um, from the city of Unley, and it was built by Walter Turo um, uh, of Unley, and uh, he was a notable mason and builder in Unley, and um, it was done for the uh, 
wives and mothers of the fallen from the, those regiments in Unley and in, in, in Adelaide. Um, and of the Adelaide regiment, uh, many of them came from the southwest corner of the city. In fact, Max Lance Campbell, who wrote an article about this in SA Life, told me that um, uh, Maxwell Street was known as the street of war heroes because there were so many fallen sons that came from that street alone. And it has a lot of significance to people in, in Unley and the southwest of the city. And um, uh, Mayor Lachlan Klein from the uh, city of Unley is also concerned and he was endeavouring to, uh, I'm not sure if this has come through to us, but right to, uh, to us before this meeting, um, uh, urging us to basically uh, leave it in the South Park land and optimally move it to uh, its original location, St Louis Cohen Avenue, where the circle of pines and the, and the wattle trees still remain. Um, uh, the Unley councillor um, uh, uh, has also moved a motion uh, for the Unley Council, going up to the next Unley Council meeting, urging for us to leave the, uh, the uh, thing in its original location and optimally move it back to its original location rather than move it to, to Kintour Avenue, where it's really just a corralling of sort of various, various things and where certainly a visual feature is intended to go, but a new modern feature that maybe monuments um, the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 might be a fitting new um, uh, edifice that could be located in the location that has been made for this in Kintour Avenue and that would be a fitting way of commemorating the end of the First World War and the beginning of peace. And um, um, uh, uh, Mark Boucher from the uh, uh, Pulteney Grammar School and the Legacy Organisation is also written to us. Um, and they have expressed their desire along the same lines and it has a um, uh, uh, connection with uh, students of that school. Councillor, I'm going to conclude your arguments or seek the comfort of your chamber for an extra two minutes. Happy, Happy members, I need to put that to you, an extra two minutes for Councillor Wilkinson. I've got a majority, the floor you. is yours. Um, the, uh, uh, and they've undertaken to um, to uh, actually volunteer labour to help re-establish the, um, the gardens and maintain the gardens in the original location. So there's a lot of people who care about what happens with this, um, with this memorial, which is not the property of the City of Adelaide nor, nor the state government. It, is, it, it came upon the request of the mothers and children of those boys who fell. And, um, and I regret that I was not aware about its significance at the time of our decision to agree to move it when we did. But now, in the light of that full information, I really do it this. Uh, it's a difficult move because we've made undertakings to say they come, etc., to agree to move it. So it's not an easy thing to be doing. But I'm moving this because I think it's the right thing to be doing. It's certainly not the easy thing to do. So I ask for your support. I'd like to welcome Mayor Lachlan Klein into the Adelaide City of Adelaide Council Chamber. Welcome, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Wilkinson, you are seconded by Councillor Corbell. Councillor Corbell, will you wish to speak to this matter? Yes, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, I think Councillor Wilkins said, has said a lot of what I wanted to say, but there are a couple of extra things. One is that it's really come across quite strongly from the deputation and also from the letter which I've received from Dr. David Faber, um, who's an adjunct senior lecturer at Flinders University and councillor for the Historical Society of South Australia and also a local Southport resident, that there is strong enough community interest in this matter and that there's opposition to us moving it from its place. It's a sacred place, the place that it exists at the moment and the previous place where it was located. Um, and the, what's come across really clearly to me is that that connection to the place is very strong and that we shouldn't move it. Um, and it wasn't, it didn't come across clear in the administration comment, but it has come through really clearly now that that strong connection to the place and the space is really important and that we should leave um, the centre um, task where it is. I think it's also questionable that Council has provided this agreement when we've been informed that we don't even have legally necessarily 
the right to be able to do that when it, we didn't chip in to pay for it to be placed in the southern parklands. We've just maintained the local space around which it is located. So the other thing is that the 10th 27th Battalion Royal South Australian Regiment has an association and a governing council and I don't believe that they were consulted and they're a key stakeholder. And if they haven't been consulted, then we're missing out on the views of a significant group of people in the community that have a silver connection to this. In addition to that, the Wattle Day Association weren't consulted by our administration. So that's another key stakeholder that should have been consulted um, and wasn't. And in light of that and the knowledge that they've put it, the Wattle Day Association did put a petition into the state government to not move it. Um, I support Councillor Wilkinson's motion to leave it as is, and I, in fact, would support um, the relocation of it to its original location. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. I've got the Deputy Lord Mayor, and I'll look to other speakers beyond that, but Councillor Clarehan, thank you. I won't miss you, Councillor Clarehan, I promise. Deputy Lord Mayor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And look, I'm not going to support the rescission motion, and, but I, before I make my remarks, I do just want to acknowledge that I understand that people will have quite different views about this, because I think it is a bit of an emotional issue. And, and it certainly is for me, because my, um, my beloved paternal grandfather was at Gallipoli at the time that this was um, put in place. Um, and uh, so it wasn't just, while it might have been presented by the citizens of Adelaide and Unley, it wasn't only recognising the citizens of Adelaide and Unley. My grandfather was a farmer from Keith uh, and he was uh, on the peninsula at the time that this was put in place. Uh, and I became interested in it only after the original motion was put before us and that it be moved to the more prominent location on North Terrace and I went and had a look at it. Um, it I, I live near the south, in the southwest corner. I've spent most of my life actually in the Princess, a fair part of my life in the Princess Elizabeth playground with my children and a lot of time in the South Park lands with my dog and I had never noticed it there until we decided last time to move it. I think it was overlooked where it was and I very much support it moving to a more prominent location. Um, I, I acknowledge that maybe a hundred years ago there were some reasons for placing it in that, in that particular spot but I think 100 years on, there are some very good reasons for placing it in a new spot. Not least because we've now built, as a, as a centenary gesture, we've now built an Anzac walk um, that was designed specifically with this beautiful little cross at its northern axis. There are four lights, if you go and have a look, there are four lights embedded in the pavement, ready to shine up on this little thing when it gets moved. Um, the idea is that the cross be on that end and the, I don't know what even that's called, the sort of cenotaph down the Shrine other end, of Shrine of Remembrance is down the other end, and they both bookend the, the beautiful and um, gracious walk that's been designed. I've had the honour of walking that walk with the architect who designed it, who told me the passion he feels for that cross and the way he built that into his design. This was consulted on, the Anzac walk and all of its elements were consulted on significantly. Uh, and I think, um, uh, as to the um, as to consulting heavily, I, I I understand there might be some people who've been missed. I wouldn't put the Wattle Day Association in that. Uh, well, I wouldn't criticise our administration for missing the Wattle Day Association because I've just looked them up on the internet, and their objects of that association are to celebrate. Uh, to celebrate the 1st of September as Wattle Day, as a celebration of celebrating Australia, and to support and to and to encourage the use of wattle as our national symbol. And um, that's, you know, I can see that a, 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 an administration that was looking to around to see who, who needed to be consulted on this issue would not necessarily have thought an, an organisation whose objects were as limited as that were need, needed to be consulted in relation to this particular issue. So I, I fully acknowledge that different people have different views about it. For myself, I want the cross that commemorates my grandfather's contribution to the war effort to be in the most prominent location that it can be, where it can teach and be observed by the maximum number of people and serve its purpose, that is, as a reminder of what happened on that peninsula between April 1915 and December 1915. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I've uh, got Councillor Clarehan. 
Look, thank you, Lord Mayor. I, I uh, on this occasion, don't agree with the Deputy Lord Mayor. I think for this particular issue, context is everything. And um, I think there's an opportunity for us to uh, make sure that the surrounds of this cenotaph are actually, or this memorial, are actually conducive to telling the story and to ensuring that people do understand the significance of this particular uh, memorial. My question, Lord Mayor, um, was if this is revoked, could I have a comment from administration as to whether uh, Councillor Wilkinson's motion is sufficient uh, to alert Dipti, uh, who I understand are probably ready to go full steam ahead, uh, to the fact that this motion has, uh, to this decision has been reconsidered by council, and who would then be responsible um, for reconsidering the removal of this um, memorial? In other words, I think we need to do more than just um, acknowledge the significance and the location, but as uh, administration have said, it's sort of gone beyond that in its current form. It's in DIPT's hands currently. So what is what would have to be required and do we need to add anything to Councillor uh, Wilkinson's motion um, to allow uh, Council and our active team to reconsider. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. CEO, can I refer that matter to you, please? Yes, through Lord Mayor. I understand we'd need to have a conversation with the State Government and we would report back to Council the details of that. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. I've got Councillor Antic followed by Councillor Moran. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I just wanted to quickly, because it's all been said, but I just wanted to endorse what the Deputy Lord Mayor has said. I, I don't uh, spend much time in the South Parklands, but um, I, uh, I do uh, spend enough time down there and have done to notice that I didn't notice it either. And I think it's a terrible shame. It's a beautiful monument. Um, and we've got a, a magnificent new Anzac Walk uh, down on Kintour Avenue. Why would we include it? I get all the arguments about um, history and respecting that, and I think we can do both. I mean, it, it has moved already once from 1915 to 1940, so you know, just because it did doesn't mean it shouldn't. And um, I, I just think that the overarching issue here is it would be a terrible shame if more people couldn't see it, because I certainly didn't know it was there um, until very recently, until this issue came up. So uh, the whole purpose of it is to uh, afford people an opportunity to look back and respect the, um, uh, the deeds of those who, who fell and those who gave their lives, and I think uh, that, that moving it into a more prominent location will do exactly that. So, so I, I, I don't support the precision motion. I, I think we can find a way to move it into a prominent place on Kintour Avenue. Thank you, Councillor Antic. Uh, members, you are debating a motion on notice to revoke a previous decision of Council. Councillor Moran, the floor is yours. Yes, well, this is very vexed up until uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor spoke. I was definitely for the rescission motion, but <laughs> I'm now definitely against the rescission motion. Um, the co context is everything. Um, the, the, these war memorials don't belong to any individual people. All our relatives fought in these wars, and some of mine were in the Dardanelles. And I would like to be able to go into the designated area that we and the state have spent a fortune on Anzac Walk with the prime purpose of taking these very out of the way um, memorials and uh, statues to put them in so that children coming to the State Library and so forth can see and also on Anzac Day that they'll be visible from the march. Now I too I even tried to find it today. It is, it is really hidden in the park plans. I assume it's been moved from one place to quite a to close place, but it is it is not available by its its very hidden um, position to the general public. And as I said, this belongs to all of us. We were all in in some way in the Dardanelles. We were all in World War One. We were all in World War Two. All our relatives were uh, in some way. So I think this must be moved. It's like the Victoria Cross here. We brought it out of our archives so that it can be seen and on display by people coming to the town hall. And I think this lovely memorial um, should be moved to where it can be seen, where it's prominent in a beautiful setting, and the, the children of today will see it. The children of today certainly will not see it if it's left in its current position or even moved back to its original position. It is too hidden. It should go where there's a purpose-built, beautiful um, walk for it. Um, 
I think the people that have spoke have a, have a personal feeling of ownership to it, and, and by the Wattle Society, um, all praise to them, and all um, uh, my sympathies are with them if this does get moved, because they obviously have a very emotional, um, sentimental attachment to it. However, things move and things change. They go to better positions. Now, we've identified, I don't think there's one person on council here that didn't say, but why would people complain? It's a much better position. And yet I su suggest we are going to let it move to its old position, I get the feeling. But I said, think again. The new position is better. More people will see it. The Dardanelles are very, something lost in history will become something personal again when they read the, the plinth and the, and the story of it. Don't, don't bury it in the parklands. Bring it out into the sunlight. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I've got Councillor Aviard, then I have Councillor Corbell who may ask a question but not debate. So, Councillor Aviard, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, I do, um, inf I do um, definitely feel with what Councillor Wilkinson is doing and some of the deputation we've heard today and the emails we've received, I do support the Deputy Lord Mayor in this and I think it's important to remember that the importance of memorials is really about uh, showcasing them. It's about remembering why they were there in the first place. And these are the things that us as a council have an obligation for our community to be able to showcase and celebrate and remember uh, most importantly. Uh, I think with the redevelopment of um, uh, obviously Rundle Mall, uh, the amount of people that visit it and the discussion now we're having uh, with the tram link that's going to be in the area, it's going to bring definitely more people to the area, it's going to showcase more of the monuments and I think plug people back to that history which is very important. Um, as a Central Ward Councillor, I've never seen it before or heard of it before until this has all sort of come up in 2015. So I think having it at a prominent location where Council and the State Government and also Federal Government and, and others have invested significant amount of time and money uh, to uh, develop uh, the Memorial on North Terrace, it's important to be able to showcase all those elements there. So look, I, although I sort of wasn't half mind about it, I think the Deputy Lord Mayor definitely tipped me over uh, with her debate. And uh, yeah, I'll definitely be uh, supporting uh, the Deputy Lord Mayor and, uh, if she's moving uh, an alternate motion and also not supporting this, basically. Thank you, Lord Mayor. And thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Councillor Abiyad. Uh, Councillor Corbell, you have a question? Well, Mayor, it's just a question. I um, sit on the Governing Council for the um, 10th 27th Battalion Royal South Australian Regiment. And um, I've only attended one meeting because they hold the meetings on Tuesdays, which is generally when I'm at council. I am intrigued to know why, um, because the council has an appointed representative, this has not come to my attention um, previously to be able to bring this up at a meeting or at least write a letter to um, the committee about this so that they can then provide some input. Keeping in mind that 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 association is um, a combination of people who have previously been attached to the 10th and 27th. So all units and individuals that were that were and are attached to. So Councillor, your question is? Um, so to clarify, my question is, has the administration, or why did the administration not approach that governing council? CEO. Through Lord Miller, but I don't have the answer to that question. I could only take it on notice, unless any other staff here. I don't believe we we have. Perhaps then, just through the chair, um, the report that came to council on the sixth of October, twenty fifteen, outlined a number of letters we received from various bodies um, um, in regards to supporting the project. And as part of that, in an out of session paper about a month before, we'd outlined proposed relocation of that Dardanelles Memorial, just for noting. So as part of the paper that came to you on the 6th of um, October 2015, the attachments outlined the requests from those various parties who were representing the ex-service community. Okay. Well, my follow-up question is, is there any um, massive urgency that we, we deal with this today, or can we defer it so that this particular council and association can be contacted to hear their views on this matter. I know, I know that it might not necessarily sway the elected body because there seems to me that there's not a lot of support for keeping it where it is and they want people, people want to move, elected members want to move it. But I am interested to know if there's no urgency, I think it's important that we communicate with them. See you. 
it's really all about uh, consultation really would be the role of the De Development Assessment Commission. We can certainly um, put that proposal to them to undertake the consultation that you just mentioned um, as a way forward. Okay, well, if, if this is unsuccessful, um, then I would like Council to... Councillor on the phone, you can't do that. You can only ask questions. You can't foreshadow. To you've, take that on you've, board. You've had your debating time. I think the members have registered your message. So, uh, members, do I have any further debate? I've got Councillor Milani. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, just to um, summarise, I think I, I too am a bit like Councillor Moran. I, I thought there was um, some validity in this um, uh, revocation, but um, I, I've since probably been persuaded. But my question is, Councillor Corbell mentioned in her um, uh, three minutes that um, that the council, she referred to the council's role in the approval process of this, and I, I would have thought we would have some role in that. But it also says that in here, um, it went to, to DAC, obviously. Um, it has the support of the State Heritage Branch. Um, could I just get some clarity on DAC? DAC is, is the approval approving body, have I got that correct? That's correct. And is, and, Right, okay, I'll we'll just leave it at that, I think. Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Councillor Slava. Thank you, Lord Mayor. A lot's been said, but I'm going to support Councillor Wilkinson's motion on this. Um, sometimes it's not about money, sometimes it's not about the location or the spotlight. And as I've heard tonight, there's people that want it in the parklands where there is no spotlight. Somewhere between here and Unley, halfway, maybe not quite, but closer to those from Unley as well, and I'd like to consider that and support uh, your motion on this. Thank you. Members, before I hand to Councillor Wilkinson, just procedurally, you are about to make a decision once Councillor Wilkinson has summed up with regards to a motion on notice to revoke. You are revoking a previous decision of this Council. Should this motion um, succeed, I'm sure the Council Wilkinson would then move on to the second part. Should this motion fail, the status quo will prevail, which was a decision of Council some time back. Council Wilkinson, to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, and thank you, Councillor Slumman, for those, those words which really do echo the importance of this to the people in the city of Unley, not just the city of Adelaide. And I think it's somewhat um, inappropriate to sort of corral monuments all into one spot, like a like a um, Las Vegas, where you can see an Eiffel Tower, you can see this and that, and having a sort of a, a pulling together. I, I don't think that's an appropriate thing to do with historic monuments, let alone ones that are dedicated and dedicated in the location for a very meaningful reason. Um, I know that great lengths have gone to, to make a spot for it. But I think the walk was said to be by one writer. The walk needs the monument more than the monument needs the walk location. I, they need something to put at the end of that walk. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to desecrate this monument by unrooting it from its original location in South Lark Parklands and putting it over in, 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 in Kintour Avenue. We could have a new monument to, to the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. 2019, for example, uh, a new modern monument that is is, a, is a, something like that, in that location. Um, but you know, these monuments are not just about having um, uh, maximum uh, uh, necessarily eyes on people who care about it. Want it in, in, in the South Parklands, people in the southwest corner of the city, people in Unley, um, and um, I mean the Borough Charter talks about moving a heritage building. This is a state heritage place. Is a is a is a is a, a last resort move if it's if there's no other way of to, you know saving it other than moving it it's only in that scenario that you actually relocate a heritage building so um, and uh, to take an extreme example you wouldn't pick up Stonehenge and move it closer to the hotel so tourists could get a better gander at it but you know, it's the same principle of, 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 of removing the heritage building from its actual rightful location. Now, what council did in 1940 against the wishes of the RSL and, and the, the day was, I think, a totally conceived move to move it to where it is. And the rationale, I understand, was because in 1940, before they had gap watering and things like that, the council had a parkland sort of maintenance thing along the edge of the parkland. So it was easier, basically, to put it there 
where they were maintaining the garden rather than St Louis Cohen Avenue, which is the which is the avenue that connects only and and, and Adelaide. So you know that was the reason why it was moved, and I think. Um, it, what I would like to see happen is that it gets moved back to its original location and that we do a new monument, uh, picking up on Councillor Hender's uh, aspirations, at, at King Troy Avenue. But that we don't do that at the expense of, of the memories of, of those people that dedicated this to their forum here in the South Park lands, to the people of Unley as well as the people of Adelaide and those battalions. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Members, you have a motion on notice to revoke. Those in favour? Those against? The motion on notice to revoke fails. Thank you, councillors. Members, the, I'll move you on to item 12.4. And uh, just for the uh, benefit of the gallery, because um, I understand there were a number of course deputations around that matter, uh, I do encourage all members of the community, please, when you'd like to make a deputation to the City of Adelaide, please do so before 4 p.m. on a Friday. And uh, then we can duly consider your deputation request. Thank you, members. Thank you for the debate. Uh, thank you for the members of the gallery. And thank you, Dr. Dolman, for your presentation. Members, could I please move you on to item 12.4, which is a item with a recommendation to note and consider. You have a recommendation from administration moved by Councillor Abiyad, seconded by Councillor Clarahan. Councillor Abiyad, would you wish to speak to the recommendation? Is that my right, Lord? Councillor Clarahan, do you wish to speak to the matter? No. Members, anyone from the floor? Councillor Slama. Thank you. I'd just like to pass on my thank you to the team, Sean, Claire and uh, Ray, for looking into this um, big project, Blue Sky project, um, and noting that uh, the, the Commonwealth Games is, is on the horizon and a bid for it is possible. And what, what this has been able to achieve is for us as a council to then have a platform on which we can communicate with the state government on and also have a premium position there that we would look at a multi-purpose facility somewhere in the park and think that was possible, so thank you. Members, any further debate? I'm handing you back to Councillor Abiyad to sum up. Sorry, Members, those in favour is printed. Those against, we carry item 12.4. Thank you, Members. Members, I'm taking you on to item 12.5. Now, members, what I will be doing is looking for a uh, member to move as printed or otherwise. We will debate the motion we have before us. I'll then ask you to vote on the motion you have before you. Then I will be asking you for nominations. So I will do that after we have dealt with the principal motion we have before us. So do I have a mover for the as printed part of it, Councillor Abiyad? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Vershaw had hand up first. Councillor Abiyad, would you wish to speak to the as printed motion? Uh, no, Lord Mayor. Councillor Vershaw. Members, any debate on what you have in front of you? Councillor Wilkinson. Actually, just to say something, sorry, Lord Mayor. Well, yes, I preserve my right, I'm happy to speak up to Councillor Wilkinson. Okay, Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you. Um, it's a question of the administration. I understand the legislation does enable the council <laughs> to appoint the independent members of the City Assessment Panel. Um, so item um, six delegates to the CEO. I understand we do have some options. What options do we have in terms of how we may alternatively elect to uh, do that? And I'll move that as an amendment. Because uh, uh, it could be that that uh, is referred to council to point four. Members, what I'll do is I'll enable the CEO to answer the question first and then Councillor Wilkins and you may then determine your next move based upon the answer to the question you've asked first. CEO? Yes, yeah, real Lord Mayor. Yeah, I understand that, <coughs> that um, there are a variety of options for Council to choose, but I'll ask County Ditter to just work us through those. Through the Lord Mayor, um, Council does have the, capac the capacity to appoint uh, the four independent members to sit on the council assessment panel. The recommendation you have before you is that council delegates that authority uh, to make the appointment uh, to the CEO. Should council wish to consider other options, 
um, council may wish to consider delegating to the CEO to invite the existing um, five uh, members who sit on the current DAP uh, to apply for those positions with a view to the CEO making the decision on the appointment of the four positions. The other option that council may wish to consider is that the CEO uh, go forward and call for expressions of interest to the general community um, with a view to uh, the CEO making a short list of potential uh, applicants uh, and bringing that back into the chamber for the, for the chamber to make a decision on those four appointments. Okay, does that, does that assist with the answer to the question? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, it has always been the uh, position of the council that it, it gets to appoint the external members of the DAP. That's not something that's previously been referred or delegated to the CEO. So I would have thought of maintaining that status quo. I understand the legislation requires now only one hopefully one worthwhile elected member to be that single elected person on the body, um, but, and then four independent members. Um, so um, uh, I, I think uh, we should maintain that position where, where the... Uh, so Councillor, what would you wish to do? We're not, we're not obliged to refer to this. Okay, so then I propose an amendment that the um, to part six yes yes um, could you assist the secretariat with your wording please councillor yeah. i think we could ask uh, we could ask administration to give us those words no i need the councillor well, at least express his intent this afternoon to seek some assistance for this very purpose so that i could have some alternative wording to that, so um, um, that the appointment of four independent members be referred back to council for decision. That's it. CEO. So if you just watch your screen, councillor, that'll reflect the changes. If you could just uh, indicate your comfort with what the CEO prepare a short list and refer. For the CEO to prepare, prepare, sorry, prepare a shortlist and how are you going, Council? Three of them now. Perhaps our director could come over and just help the councillor. She has some words. That the council delegates the CEO to call for expressions of interest for independent members to apply for four independent member positions of the new council assessment panel and select four members. Okay, if you could read that again, councillor, that sounds like your attempt. So if you could read that very slowly so the secretary can capture every word, please. Okay, now while those words have been captured, members, you're aware of the intent of what Councillor Wilkinson is achieving to do here, so I'll look for a seconder. I'm happy to second that, Lord Mayor. Clarehan is your seconder, Councillor Wilkinson, so you're moving an amendment. Uh, would you wish to speak to the amendment? The floor is yours. Um, yes, the legislation has changed and the 
Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. The legislation has changed, but the de legislation has changed not in a way that requires council to absolve itself of its usual role of, of selecting the independent members. The legislature could have been done differently where the minister chose the independent members, but, but that hasn't been the case. It's been left, uh, the discretion is left to council to make that decision, and I think we should maintain that discretion. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. So you're moving the amendment. Your seconder was Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Clarehan, do you wish to speak to the amendment? Then I'll hand to the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I actually uh, made my own notes in relation to point six, and uh, I felt that uh, this was a new procedure being presented. I think that Council has been absolutely um, not muted, but absolutely depowered in terms of its Im input uh, into the whole um, development, uh, new development uh, assessment process. Uh, we've been told that, for example, you know, our role was at the pointy end, at the top end in the policy uh, development, but we've just learned tonight, well, in fact, a lot of good that was. Uh, I, and I refer members to item, uh, sorry, I'm not, I haven't got an item number here, but the presiding members report in relation to the Minister of Planning's announcement, uh, recent announcement in relation to uh, the North Adelaide Institutions and Colleges DPA, the Capital City DPA, etc., where all our requests and recommendations for policy input were just ignored. So I think we need to retain some element of control over our uh, development assessment uh, process and the uh, amendment put up by Councillor Wilkinson will attempt to do that. So I encourage members uh, that to support this amendment that the um, input uh, of or the, uh, the uh, listing of applications through uh, an open expression of interest be, be presented to us so that we can have a look and see um, the qualifications of the people being put up to um, sit on the, um, the new cap uh, so that uh, we can at least have a sense of um, some uh, input into that rather than being to totally muted and cut off at the legs. Thank you, Councillor Clareham. Members, I'm going to keep the ball rolling along. Deputy Lord Mayor, followed by um, Councillor Maloney. Um, Lord Mayor, I support the amendment. I, I just wanted to um, be clear though, um, I had anticipated actually without giving it much thought that um, we would be looking to reappoint um, members of the existing DAP. Uh, obviously, there's only some of them because there's more members on the DAP than we now have a chance to do. And I saw some, say at the time I was giving that some consideration, I saw some benefit in that given it's a time of great upheaval and some continuity might be useful. Do you, do you want to? Okay, the, the, um, the mover has indicated he might be wanting to vary to accommodate my concern about. Uh, yes, you just need to, for the benefit of your fellow elected members and your mover, what is your variation, DLM? Would you be able to share that? It's the, it's the mover's variation, Lord Mayor. No, DLM, it needs to come from you. You're suggesting, you're suggesting the variation. Well, that really all I wanted, actually, I wasn't seeking a variation, I was just seeking clarity, that the, that the existing members will be given an opportunity to apply for this because I think it's really important that we uh, that we have some continuity if we can, at least some of those members are carried over. So Deputy Lord Mayor, what would that wording look well, like? I'm for asking the... whether they'd be entitled to apply. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, through you, Lord Mayor. Um, just to be really clear, um, the expression of interest will be an open expression, but the existing members will be invited to apply. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, Councillor Milani, please. Just a quick question um, on uh, the um, appointment of a council member. Um, I noticed in the terms of restaurant reference, it's appoint one member. Is there an opportunity to have a proxy at all? See <coughs> <coughs> so you. Shanti, did you Through the Lord Mayor, to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. 
Okay, so members, we have an amendment. Councillor Clarehan, you've spoken, so you need to ask a question only. Question? Um, Lord, I just wanted to ask um, about the uh, terms of reference, which say that, a uh, that, uh, that the members will be appointed for a period of two years. Does that include council's representative? And the question is, if that person uh, no longer is a member of council, do they then have the opportunity to continue on as a member of CAP, or would they then be required to stand down and a new a new a member appointed? I sense the answer to that, but we'll get uh, confirmation from it's the CEO. It's not specified. Yeah, through you or me, I understand that the elected member would be required to stand down from the role position. Thank you. Okay, members, Councillor Wilkinson is going to sum up on a proposed amendment. <coughs> Councillor Wilkinson. Summed up. Summed up. Members, you have, you have a proposed amendment before you. Those in favour? Those against? Carried. We go back to the substantive motion moved by Councillor Abiyad. Any further debate, members? There is none. Councillor Abiyad. Just in summing up, Lord Mayor, this is deplorable, I've got to say. Um, it seems that the state government will continue at every cost to diminish the power of council, uh, the power of local government and the representative power that we have as elected by the City of Adelaide constituents. This is a continual effort and a continual hit to demonise democracy in every single approach. The government seems to pick and choose the things they like. If they like the Rivergate precinct, they'll take it. If they like part of the parklands, they'll take it. If they like part of the development assessment uh, panel, they will also take it. And this is concerning. Um, we have gone down from four representatives on that uh, panel. We have gone down from approvals over $10 million to this. I mean, if the role of, go of local government is not also to assess planning, I don't know what the role of local government is. I mean, that's part and parcel of what we do every day, especially in the Capital City Committee. I am completely against every single effort by the state government to push us out from representing our constituents. Obviously, we have no choice but to accept this. Uh, however, I'd like to be on record uh, noted that I object uh, for us and obviously on behalf of our constituents that their powers have been diminished and that this is not democracy. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Here, here, Councillor. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you, Members. Now, I now take you to to address the nomination of uh, one elected member from the City of Adelaide to join the CAP. So I look for nominations. Councillor Antic. I'd like to nominate Councillor Abia. Councillor Abia, do you accept? Yes, Lord Mayor. Members, do I have further nominations? Deputy Lord Mayor. Can I nominate two people, uh, Lord Mayor? I understand two others are interested. If they accept, you can, yes. Can I nominate Councillor Wilkinson and Councillor Moran? Councillor Moran, do you accept if nominated? I certainly do. Councillor Wilkinson, do you accept if nominated? So members, do we have any further nominations? We don't. Now members, given that this is one position, uh, I will now need to look to a ballot, which is now coming your way. And members, when filling out your ballot paper, please identify one elected member only. <laughs> Councillor Moran? <laughs> Councillor Moran? <laughs> Just a process perspective, Nom the, the councillors that have been nominated, can they stay in the room and vote or must they leave the chamber? Uh, to clarify, members who have been nominated may participate in the ballot for the selection of a preferred nominee. However, at the point that council oh, okay. proceeds to make such appointment, conflict arises and that individual will need to declare and leave the chamber. Just <laughs> 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 said we have to have one person there. 
Members, the vote has been had. Councillor Moran is the preferred nominee. So, Councillor Moran, I would need you to leave the chambers for your fellow chamber in order for your fellow members to deliberate. Members, I require a motion from the floor. Councillor Clarehan, you're moving to adopt the appointment of um, Councillor Moran. Seconded by. Councillor Antic had a hand up first. Members, any debate? I'll put that for you. Those in favour? Those against, we carry. Thank you, members. If we could please invite Councillor Moran back into the chamber. Now, members in an ideal world, I'm going to quicken the pace of this meeting. We have item 12.6 for you to, to uh, approve, uh, which is a uh, non-recoverable debt write-off. Moved as printed, Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Abiyad. Members, any debate? Summed up by Deputy Lord Mayor. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry that item. Thank you, members. Members, item 12.7, which is to note and approve, which is a 2016-17 quarter revised forecast, page 74 of your papers. Deputy Lord Mayor, are you moving as printed? Do I have a seconder, members? Councillor Abiyad, do I have any debate, members? Summing up, DLM? Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry item 12.7. Members, item 12.8 to note, third quarter reporting strategic plan 2016 to 2020. DLM, you're moving as printed. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Slama. <laughs> Members, any debate? DLM, you're summing up. Members, those in favour? Those against? We carry that item. 12.9. Quarterly Open Council de uh, Decision Update, page 114 to note, moved by the DLM, seconded by Councillor Abiyad moved his finger. <laughs> Come on, members, work with me here, please. Um, any debate, members? Those in favour? Those against? We carry 12.9. Emerging key risks, members, we have none noted. Questions on notice? which is item 13 on your agendas. We have no questions on notice for the duty. We don't, we move on. So we now go to questions without notice. Do I have any questions without notice, members? I do. I have a question without notice. Councillor Moran, would you like to read your um, question without notice to your fellow members, please? And then we'll seek a uh, response from administration. I think it was the... Um, 
current on status of the uh, it's, on your, it's on your screen if you wish, Councillor. Oh, no. Yep. No. <laughs> Was it the, the frame yes, what is the current status of the Frome Road bikeway, the northern section and the revision of the southern section? Thank you, Councillor. Can I refer that matter to the CEO, please? Yeah, Beth Davidson Park, thanks. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, the, the project being undertaken in four sections or four segments, um, the first of which is Perry Street to North Terrace. So in that piece, the concept design is completed, it's on schedule. Um, engagement with adjacent rate pairs, consistent with Council's resolution, is currently underway and that will be closing on Tuesday the 13th of June. But as we're gathering feedback, we are adding that to the concept designs. We've also gone out to tender for detailed designs, so we're running the process simultaneously through the project. So detailed designs gone out, we'll be awarding that contract shortly to coincide with the um, completion of the engagement and then we'll move to the detailed design phase, at which time we'll also be going out for construction. So there'll be a tender running through that stage as well. And then we're looking to commence construction late August, August, early September. So that design in its detail, as I said, will be completed around about Wednesday 14th of June. It'll be in the design room and we will remind members again if they want to come and have a look at that design in its final form before it actually goes to the technical detailed design heading into construction. The um, next stage that's currently in concept is Victoria Drive to Barton Terrace. So that concept is underway at the minute, hasn't gone out for engagement yet. The North Terrace to Victoria Drive is the section which is actually interfacing with the new high school, with ORA, a whole lot of conflicts in there, and that one is going to take a little longer for that detailed analysis to get to concept. So back to Pirisha North, once that's completed, should be completed, we're aiming to do that by mid-December, then we go back to the Wakefield to Perry Street section, so that, that southern section. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Councillor Moran. <laughs> Members, I have no further questions without notice. Councillor Mullaney, you have a question without notice? Uh, well, I'm a bit confused because 14 says questions without notice and motions without notice and so does 16. So is it four? I would like to do a motion without notice, but is it 14 or 16? I'm going to deal with them both in 14. So we'll work through questions without notice and I'll look to the members for motions without notice. We will delete item 16, which is a duplication and then we'll move on to motions on notice from the members as recorded. And Lord Mayor, I would like to uh, put forward Just a motion. Money, sorry, I'll just stop you there. Oh, members, do I have any further questions without notice before oh, I move sorry. into motions without? You do, Councillor Clarehan? Thank you, Lord Mayor. A question of the administration. Does the, um, I guess is it South Australian Power or Network, who does our upgrade of infrastructure for um, poles and wires, etc.? SA Power Networks? Oh, that's right. Um, I was wondering whether um, whenever they undertake work within the city council area, does the South Australia um, Power Networks contact council to advise of those upgrades? And if so, um, is any feedback provided to them? For example, increasing the amount of infrastructure in, in heritage areas? as in above-ground infrastructure. CEO. Yeah, Beth Davidson Park, thanks. And through you, Lord Mayor. Um, generally, SAPN do contact us and we provide feedback to them on the projects. I couldn't say it happens 100% of the time. Generally, they do. And just a, a, a follow-up, um, if they're going to install extra wires and increase the height of the um, poles etc 
in, for example, heritage areas, do we do we have any conversations with them about the potential for undergrounding, or do we just say that's all okay? Through you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, it would be situational, but if it was actually raising or significantly altering, it would need approval, it would need council approval or development approval, depending upon the nature of the project. So certainly not an administration approval, um, but it's situational, councillor. Thank you. Members, any further questions without notice? In absence of, I now will move to motions without notice. I'm going to go to Councillor Corbell first because I have a written motion without notice in front of me, which you do two members, then I'll look to Councillor Maloney. Councillor Corbell, you have a motion without notice. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I take the motion as read and I see the second one for the motions? Or do you want me to read it out? I need you to read it okay. for the purposes of recording, please, okay. Councillor, because that it's without notice. Sure. Thank you, Lord Mayor. That Council call on the Lord Mayor to write to the Minister for Transport, the Honourable Stephen Mulligan MP, to seek the Minister's advice as to what solutions are being considered or actions by the Government to integrate the efficient and effective flow of increased pedestrians and vehicular traffic, including trams and emergency <laughs> service vehicles, around the new RAH precinct on the corner of North Terrace and West Terrace <coughs> through to the Adelaide High School on the corner of West Terrace and Curry Street. Thank you. Uh, you've got a second of a Deputy Lord Mayor. floor is yours to debate. Thank you, um, Lord Mayor and Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, look, there's, there's so much activity that's happening with the new Royal Adelaide Hospital moving. Um, inpatients will be moving to the new Royal Adelaide Hospital as of the, um, the 4th of September this year. And the new Royal Adelaide Hospital forms a new integral part of our city landscape and is going to change um, the, the whole precinct around the South West. Members, That's please, you have a member debating. Sorry. Sorry. South, Sorry. Yeah, north, northwest of the city. Um, it includes Samory, the new um, University of Adelaide Health and Medical Sciences building, the University of South Australia's new Health Innovation building, the Flinders, Uni's, um, Flinders University's John Chalmers Centre for Transforming Healthcare, and it's all forming part of the new biomedical precinct in Adelaide, known as the um, Biomed City. And I'm interested to know what the state government's plans are around the increasing number of people that will be accessing that entire section of the city, um, including all the way through to Adelaide High School. There's 1,400 students at Adelaide High School, and we have a new high school, the Adelaide Botanic High School, which will be receiving students from Term 1 in 2019, with connections between the students on the, both campuses. So we will see an increasing number of students tra um, moving between the two campuses. And I think it's important that we have a clear picture from the state government about what the plans are to better cater for the pedestrian movement around that whole precinct and all the way through down to other parts of the city, including um, the old Royal Adelaide Hospital site and the Adelaide Botanical um, High School. So I seek your support in this and open it up for the debate. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. You're seconded by the Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak? Reserving your right. Reserving your right. Members to the floor. Do we have any debate? DLM, you reserved your right. Would you like to speak now? Oh, really, just to say what I, um, I really appreciate the uh, member bringing this to our attention. I think this is a really important issue for the city, and the sooner we get a handle on it, the better. Councillor Corbell, to sum up. Members to the floor, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you very much, Councillor Corbell. Councillor Maloney, motion without notice. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to put forward a motion without notice, but I'd like to do it in confidence, Lord Mayor. Uh, and uh, it's because it has um, uh, commercial in confidence um, relationship. You can do so, Councillor. Could you please give your members at least a working title for this motion? Um, yes, we'll call it commercial business case. You can do so. So, members, uh, Councillor Maloney is uh, flagging. Okay, thank you. I will move a, uh, uh, an item later on the agenda to move that into confidence and then you can move in debate. Thank you. Thank you. 
Members, no further motions without notice. I don't see any hands, so I'm now going to move on to motions on notice. Item 15.1, which is page 117 in your papers, Councillor Vershaw, motion on notice regarding welcoming people to the City of Adelaide. Councillor Vershaw, thank you for your patience on this matter, because I know it came up in a previous meeting. The floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to move a motion to seek a centre for uh, consideration of that. Uh, administration prepare a report outlining. Council the... Moran is your seconder, so you can <laughs> proceed <laughs> debating. Connections to welcome people to the City of Adelaide and the report to include students, visitors, businesses, and workers. Um, with the Cabaret Festival about to be upon us, I should say, will common be an venue? Welcome. No, nobody gets that. That's <laughs> fine. Uh, <laughs> Do you want me to sing it? No, sorry. It's Cabaret, you know. Welcome and bienvenue. Anyway, um, our strategic plan has a vision that says Adelaide is a welcoming and dynamic city full of rich and diverse experiences. And I'd like to um, thank administration for their comment. Really pleased to see there is so much we're currently doing. Um, it would be great if we could perhaps be a bit louder about uh, the way that we welcome new people to Adelaide. Um, and um, I would like to suggest that we uh, work on some other actions and strategies, which I can do later. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Seconded by Councillor Moran. Would you wish to speak to it, Councillor? Uh, no, I think uh, Sandy said it very well. <laughs> Members to the floor. <laughs> Councillor Vershaw to sum up. Oh, Members for the vote, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Well done, Councillor Vershaw. We now go on to the second motion on notice, page 119 of your papers. Councillor Antic, motion on notice regarding design and consultation to my court. Mayor, I'd like to take the opportunity to congratulate uh, Councillor Vershaw on her brevity, um, subject which is dear, dear to my heart. And her singing, where he said also a singing. Anyway, uh, I'm moving a motion. I move as printed. Um, I'll look for a seconder then. Councillor Milani. Back to you, Councillor okay, Andy. Thank you. This is uh, hopefully relatively straightforward. This is a motion relating to uh, what I've described as being an H-shaped precinct of streets between uh, Wright Street and Pooja, uh, which is Wright Court. Streets, if you know it, snakes around into Field Street, which is now a uh, an outdoor dining precinct, really. I mean, it's become it's become one. It's lifting and it's, uh, it's sort of coming that way. Unfortunately, the rest of the streetscape, though, is probably a little bit um, caught behind the times and a group of the residents down there have somewhat passionately uh, pushed for uh, that to be lifted uh, and I think with good reason, I think I sent around some photos uh, this morning about the area and the precinct and it is a tricky little area, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unusual combination of industrial and residential uh, areas and, um, uh, and of course for that reason it does pose some challenges but one of the main problems with the area is the narrow footpaths which are really narrow, particularly on bin night, um, it's quite hazardous, it becomes almost a natural thoroughfare for vehicles um, and so there really isn't much room particularly on the, the right court side of the or entry point to that little precinct of streets. Um, it's also quite barren in terms of the, the, uh, the tree plantings and the greenings, it's a um, it's, it's, it's a perfect case, I think, for uh, looking to uplift that area. Um, and, and I guess also, um, importantly, um, the, um, is the issue of um, the cleanliness and the amenity. I, I, it, it's sort of a, it's a tricky one in the sense that there are, you know, unavoid, avoid, unavoidable uh, industrial problems where there are factories and therefore refuse, et cetera, et cetera. But most importantly, um, this is ultimately going to, I think, have an increased traffic flow, which is really one of the reasons why I brought this to council now to sort of fast track it. We've got the starfish development down in the, um, in the north eastern corner of the um, uh, Whitmore Square. We've got the Whitmore <coughs> Square area generally drifting out. It's a natural, a natural desire line, I think, probably for, for foot traffic. It's going to increase. What I've proposed is um, that we address it and we consult um, with both business and residents on, on a way of approaching the footpaths. The road servicing which was already scheduled but um, I'd like to see brought forward as I would do <laughs> the whole design consultation and build. Um, we think, um, having spoken to staff, that we can do a lot of that, um, some of the easy stuff uh, within the next calendar year, which is good. Uh, and then hopefully um, uh, push through to um, uh, get the rest of it designed at least in the next calendar year. So um, it's a straightforward motion. Hopefully um, you can support it. I don't need to ramp it on about it anymore. Thank you, Councillor. You're seconded by Councillor Milani. 
observing a right. Members, Councillor Wilkinson. I spoke with Councillor Anthony after going down there this morning, and um, uh, I'm a little bit uh, torn. There's a dichotomy in the street. There's some gorgeous little cottages at the western end of Rye Court, which behind them have six storeys of car park looming over their backyards, and then another half a million storeys of, of apartments looming over that. They bought those houses when there was a three or four storey height limit. I think we owe it to those people to at least, you know, their, their property value will be decimated by, by that. And we, love, know it, love it, and we owe it to them at least to do something to improve their street. It's not going to make that massive edifice behind them go away. Um, but at least we could look at undergrounding the power. That would be looking at the street, probably one and putting in some Louis Paulson light fittings. <laughs> <laughs> that would be. Um, <laughs> My councillors, the normal light fittings. Um, or we could cheap, cheap fluoros and light it up like a supermarket aisle. Oh, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Members, any further debate? I go, yes, Councillor Corbell. Um, I'm just interested, has the administration got any ideas on the costing of this project, noting that there's already an allocation of 46000 in 2019 to 2020 um, to fund roadway resurfacing? But the other items that have listed in here, um, are there any ideas around the costing of the project? CEO, please. <laughs> Beth Thompson Park, thanks. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, thank you. The, the purpose of the um, <clears throat> motion as outlined by Councillor Antic would mean that we would um, come back to you before budget adoption with a cost for the consultation and analysis, <clears throat> excuse me, in detail of the area. That then would be undertaken during 17-18 so that we would have more detail of costing the broad the broader project for 1819. We have suggested we could bring forward that um, resale that's sitting in the the notional allocation for 1920, as you've noted. But that that really is the aim of this project is that we'd be coming back with that detail during the year. Okay, for our future endorsement. Sorry, for our future endorsement. Absolutely, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, members. Now, Councillor Maney, you reserved your right, I recall, if you wish to speak. <coughs> I go back to Councillor Antic, sum up. <laughs> members, I put to you for vote. Those in favour? <laughs> Those against? We carry that item. Thank you. So that is item 15.2, which takes us on to item 15.3. Councillor Corbell, motion and notice regarding citizen juries, page 121 of your papers. Councillor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Can I take this motion as being read and I seek a seconder? Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. So my motion essentially is about um, introducing citizens' jury, jury as an opportunity for the City Council to um, improve our engagement. So the administration have already got planned a service review, and in addition to that, our consultation um, policy um, will be under review as part of our policy review. And I'd like for the administration to come back with a potential model of a way that we can include citizens' juries in the future in the City of Adelaide as part of our processes of engaging with the community. So the administration comment provides a bit of detail about what is a citizens' jury. Essentially, it's about um, bringing together a randomly selected group of people from the community who represent the community in a better way than the our existing consultation approach um, makes use of, in that any member of the public can provide their opinion. Um, so it's more representative of the community and it's been successfully um, implemented in many cities around Australia and globally, including um, the city of Melbourne. Um, it was hailed as a significant success um, in engaging a citizen's jury around their 10-year financial plan. So it's a new way of democracy. It's about being more inclusive and it's about having, having better representation. I do note in the administration comment that it can be quite costly, but this, uh, this motion is really seeking for the administration to come back with a potential model that could work for our city. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Seconded by Councillor Wilkinson. I'm happy for this idea to be explored in the first instance, so I can't commit to how we take it from there, but at least we could have a look at it.
Thank you, Councillor. Then we have Councillor Abiyad followed by the Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, unfortunately, I can't support this. I think, uh, in my mind, I see this a little bit differently. Um, I see that there's an opportunity for our community to elect us through a very democratic, open process at which they get to know the people they are electing and they trust the people they are electing to make decisions and they have an opportunity at the fourth year later after the election to decide whether that person's done a good job or not and decide to get them off the council. I think we already over consult on a lot of things that fit within our strategic plan which I find is a waste of time. Uh, in essence, public consultation is also part of the election process. It's part of engaging with the community. Our job every day is to engage with community members. Uh, look, I see um, Councillor Corbell's point, but at the end, let's do the consultation process better. I mean, even our consultation process at the moment, although it's aimed to engage as many people as possible, it still engages a minimal amount of people. Um, potentially, we want to try to expand that and do that better and have more people engaged in that process before we go to a third tier, which is the citizen jury and bringing that in. I mean, it potentially can be explored on specific set projects. We need to bring talent in where you know, we we'll require some talent around specific um, professionals that, that can assist in specific problems, but we've got that also. Uh, you know, we had a meeting on Saturday with the commercial property owners in the city. We have a meeting once every three months with the precinct groups, with the resident groups, uh, also with the business groups. So you know, fundamentally, we're doing a lot of that engagement process and feeding that through. So this for me is just another level of that. Um, it's a cool idea. I just think we do already too much of it. I mean, if anything, I'd like to do less of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, look, unfortunately, I can't, I can't support this. Deputy Lord Mayor, followed by Councillor Antic. Uh, I do support this motion. Um, I do believe that I, I, I take Councillor Abbott's point that we over consult in, in some areas. Uh, and uh, and his point that we should do a consultation process better. I think this is exactly what this is all about, doing the consultation process better. Um, it is, uh, and, and as I understand it, Councillor Corbell's um, motion is simply seeking a report on how we might incorporate it into our consultation, into our suite of consultation processes. Um, I, it, might, it may be, and I hope the report um, leaves this open, it may be that the report comes back and says it can't be incorporated into our suite of uh, consultation processes because of the cost associated with it, but I would like it investigated. The experience in Melbourne City Council was that uh, when they did this um, a couple of years ago, I think, um, it was hailed by their community as a huge success. And one of the things I really liked about it is after being consulted, their community actually voted to increase, increase rates. Now, what that shows me is that if you inform people intel and, and intelligently, um, you can actually get people to engage in a, in a topic much more deeply. I think if we go out, went out to consultation and said, you want your rates up, people would go, no. But if you go out to people and say, this is what rates, this is what rates are used for, this is the purpose, this is the consequence of keeping your rates at this level, this is the consequence of taking your rates up, and let's have a look at it over 10 years, what, that, what a difference that might make to the city. That's what they did in Melbourne, and they got their community to, uh, to not only um, <coughs> embrace, but actually advocate for the increase in rates. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily the outcome here, but I'm just saying that that sort of deep and real consultation is, is much more effective than some of the consultation that we currently do. And uh, and I would like it investigated. Obviously, the costs associated with it may well preclude us from doing it. And you wouldn't, you'd use it rarely, and you'd use it on things like 10 years, 10 year financial plans. You know, that's something you only do once every 10 years so that it's not being um, ran out for every time we want to change our outdoor dining policy. But uh, I, I would like it investigated as part of the suite that we have at our disposal. Thank you, DLM. Councillor Antic. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, actually, uh, I'm intrigued by this concept of there being, there being people out there that want their rates to go up. Uh, it strikes me, it strikes me as being a little bit like the search for the Loch Ness Monster. I'm, I'm almost inclined to put my, my hand out and uh, and try to invite that person, whoever he or she may be, to come and to come and talk about what it is they like about paying more and lower their rates. But I'm frightened of re recreating that scene in in uh, Fawlty Towers when uh, Basil uh, says to the, you know, the the occupants of the hotel room, "Come out, old Mother Hubbard, or whatever she was." And then she appears. So I won't do it because I might get stunned there. There's probably someone who thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's right. Anyway, look, I, we are talking about a separate subject, and I've just wasted a minute of my three. So we, 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 what could I even describe as a ham-fisted full show? Uh, but in any event, um, look, the concept of a citizen's jury, no, not for me. Um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with the concept of a jury full stop bid in a, in a, in a criminal trial or whatever. Not to, not to denigrate the, the, the views of the public by any means, but, but certainly Councillor Aviard is right. I mean, we, we do so much of it already, and the last thing we need to do is embroil ourselves in another um, a bed of red tape uh, surrounded by slowing the process down. I mean, really, the, the concept of the citizen's jury, in essence, is nothing more than a, than a smoke screen that the state government has provided in order to distract us. A little bit like Elvis walking through the room when you've got the problem of the financial crisis this state has found itself in. Look, there's Elvis here. Let's have a citizen's jury. It's that kind of, it's that kind of state. So look, you can also make a case for it at state government level because uh, at the end of the day, uh, I think we are representing something like 2,000 ratepayers per elected member or something like that, whereas at state government level it's something like one to 300, and, sorry, 33,000 members. So there's just no call for this at, at local government level. We're just going to wrap ourselves up, sit around and, and talk about you know, what might do, you know, whether or not we need to resurface a road or, I mean, it sort of also fundamentally misunderstands the, the fact that we basically do should be doing, although we don't, we're saving the planet from this chamber, as I recall, but um, we fundamentally should be doing basic things which don't require as much consultation, and certainly no more than we already do. We do plenty, we do it in about six different ways, and I and the cost associated with um, going to a citizen's jury, embedding consultants, I mean, this is, this is why nothing gets done full stop. We don't need more talking about this issue. So look, it's, it's a great idea in theory, but I think we do enough of it as it is in other ways. And so I just, I don't support this. But the cost as well, I should say, is, is a significant factor in this. I think that the nuclear um, citizens jury uh, costs something like $4 million now. We're kind of, you know, kind of batting eyelid at you know, what we might do, but that's a lot of money. So uh, I, I don't support it. Councillor, Elvis has left the building. Uh, members, any further debate? Councillor Clarehan. Look, I, I saw the um, the words um, citizens jury and I just thought, no, no way. Um, I just think it, it really puts us in a very difficult position because you can have the citizens jury, but you may not, this council may not necessarily agree with the outcome and would vote it down, thereby um, creating a major issue of trust with those people that have participated. And so, but but in terms of reading the um, administration's comment, they're saying that juries, and point six, juries and other deliberative processes, such as community panels, will be considered as part of the services review of the engagement function and of course cost-benefit analysis of various processes of engagement will be included as part of the service review. Well, I don't have any issue with that. So on, that gra on those grounds, I am very happy to support this, but I certainly um, don't want to see us take citizens' juries on their own um, and spend a lot of money investigating those because I don't, necessarily have a lot of investment in that. I'd much rather see more appropriate deliberative processes adopted. So I will support it, but only in as much as it is part of a whole suite of um, ways of engaging that will be considered by our administration. Members, do I have any further debate? Councillor Maloney. Just briefly, Lord Mayor, because if I'm, if I'm, I'm going to vote against it and i like to give the reason to the mover if I'm going to do vote against me. But picking up on Councillor Carahan's point, I think we can do that without actually labelling anything as citizens' jury. I, I, get, I can see why they've evolved and why they have um, uh, been used by different levels of government. But for a population of 22,000, I, I really think that that's overkill. I think that we can improve our consultation. We have workshops and we, you can use almost some similar um, fundamental sort of um, processes to engage the um, community. I don't think, once we start labelling them citizens jury, we elevate this whole piece of work that really we don't need to be writing reports about, we don't need to be doing. So I'm not, I'm not supporting it for that reason. 
Members, I might speak to this briefly also. Um, members, um, I, it, to me, it's a, I understand the aspiration, but it's consultation on consultation on consultation on consultation. I think we need to be a lot more doing. So um, uh, I think this council's aspiration is more about delivering projects, delivering policy, um, and uh, I think we reflect in many ways the aspirations of our community, and so does the consultation the administration does on our behalf. So to me, this is an exercise of a little bit of duplication. Councillor Corbett. Well, I'm a little bit surprised by um, the Chamber's response to this because really we're going to be doing a review of Council's public communication and consultation policy anyway. And we're going to be doing a review, a service review. And I'm asking through this motion for the administration as part of that work that they're going to be doing anyway to put into the mix a new idea, which has been successfully and effectively used around Australia, not just in state government level jurisdiction, in local government, the City of Melbourne, Environmental Sustainability in Geraldton, Western Australia, waste management in Noosa, Queensland. These are big ticket items. Citizens jury is going to be, if it's implemented, it's about big ticket items. And you're shutting this idea down without even giving it due consideration. I think that that is not doing, doing your due diligence. I've called for the administration to include this in the mix. They've already flagged that it might be expensive. It's going to come back to the chamber if you support it. It will come back to the chamber. We can consider it as a model, a potential model for the City of Adelaide that could work. It might not work, but you're already shutting down this idea, which is a 21st century way of doing democracy. I'm really surprised. And I seek, I seek your support in this motion. I really wouldn't like to see this just get shot down in flames before it's even had a chance to be properly considered. Councillor Antic put forward some uh, figure of $4 million. I have no idea where he got that from. Our administration haven't provided that. They've just indicated in a way that they've flagged that it's expensive. Why don't, why don't we get our administration to just put it in the mix and hear what they have to say about how it could possibly work for our city. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. Members, you have a motion? It's a bit rough when elected member says we haven't given something to you consideration. Just, just flag. Councillor Malani, you're, <laughs> I'm going to put this matter to the vote. There's no further debate, members. Sorry, Councillor Corbell has summed up. Members, those in favour? Those against? The motion fails. Correct, no. Okay, thank you members, thank you for the debate. Uh, members, I'm now going to go to item 15.4, Council Mulaney, motion on notice, residential growth incentives, page 122 of your papers. Council Mulaney, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll um, move the motion, call for a seconder. Council Moran. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, look, Lord Mayor, I'm really moving this um, on your behalf as uh, you've, you've led this initiative. And I also acknowledge that this is a passionate topic of many um, elected members in the room. In fact, all, I'd say. We, um, we know that the number of owner occupiers living in the City of Adelaide has continued to decline over um, recent decades. And we all recognise that owner occupiers um, are, an important, are an important mix amongst investors and, and, and renters. So uh, we, we recognise that. And members, uh, we also know that we are seeking to do our bit when it comes to city population growth and the growth of our economy. And the Deloitte uh, report just came out indicating you know, our, our need to increase our population. We do have about 23,500 people living in the city of Adelaide. And in 2016, we welcomed um, about 500 new residents. We now have a, a, a very good uh, four-year strategic plan. And one of the targets in that plan is to grow the residential population to 28,000 by the end of 2020. So in order to achieve that target, we have to be proactive. We really need to work on stimulating demand. More residents are good for city vibrancy, good for our businesses, good for city safety, and good for the uh, sustainability of our city. And we all know that we um, consciously want to have a balanced mix of residential owner occupiers, investors, renters uh, in our city, and that, that balance is, is key word is, is balance in that sentence. 
We also know that there's currently $2 billion worth of approved yet to be built residential developments in the City of Adelaide. And these projects have already secured planning approval and many of these are already in pre-sales phase. But these projects typically do not get built if they do not secure a high number of off-the-plan pre-sales. Members, this motion is designed to provide an incentive for owner-occupiers' purchases. It provides a five-year rate-free period for owner-occupiers when they purchase a new residential apartment or townhouse off the plan. <clears throat> the motion is designed to incentivise and reward the buyer, the resident, the owner-occupier. It's designed to stimulate demand. The motion is designed to arrest the slowly declining percentage of owner-occupiers in the city. This motion is also designed to be an economic stimulus. The unemployment rate in South Australia is too high and Council wants to do its bit to stimulate growth. The motion is designed to create investment, jobs, confidence and stimulate more people. The motion is also designed to stimulate the adaptive reuse of some commercial buildings by turning them into residential buildings. And we all know that um, vacancy rates for C and D grade buildings uh, commercial grade buildings is exceeding 20% and this motion incentivise and rewards owner-occupier residential buyers when a building is transformed from an office block into residential accommodation and that is um, a critical element we need to address. Um, I think one of the key questions that um, we've all considered... Uh, Lord Mayor, may I see four more minutes? Members, come from the Chamber to Councillor Mullaney speak for another two minutes. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I do, I've got a majority. Thank you, Councillor. I think one of the questions that we've all asked, and um, and it's about, you know, uh, should we be worried about foregoing uh, what rate revenue uh, we might be foregoing? But reality is that these projects don't get built. There are no rates. So as such, there is no downside um, to this motion. The earlier we get uptake and the greater take up we get of this initiative, we get to increase our longer term revenue generation so it's an investment that we are actually making. Uh, we have had similar initiatives um, uh, some time ago, albeit in, in the past. The other critical element that this motion calls for, and this is the critical element because not one um, uh, rate incentive initi initiative standing alone is probably going to be enough, but it also calls on the state government to complement council in our goal to stimulate greater economic activity in the City of Adelaide. This could be from uh, financial stimulus, it could be from legislative um, support and amendment. Um, and that's, and that, you know, that um, it calls on them to provide an incentive of greater or equal or greater value than what we provide. Um, and the motion recognises that um, we need to work as a team with the government to improve the economic future of our city. So, uh, and hence why the wording Lord Mayor calls upon you to write to the Minister to provide equal or greater benefits. So when uh, we look at all of these incentives combined and not just this in a standalone format, um, I think actually we'll, we'll put um, a very um, persuasive case to encourage own occupiers to move into the city to stimulate the demand that we, we need. And, and the motion also enables the CEO to work out the precise terms and conditions of our implementation. Um, devil is always in the, in the detail. So there is some sort of uh, urgency about this because we know that we have to, um, uh, we've got budgets coming up and we need to be proactive. So I commend this to you and I do reiterate that I know everyone around here is equally as supportive of increasing owner occupiers in the city and population in general. And Lord Mayor, thanks for your lead on, on this matter. Thank you, Councillor Mulaney. Councillor Moran, you second the motion. Will you care to speak to it? Uh, yes. Um, well, many people have uh, fought long and hard for a, a better deal for the owner occupier and to uh, reverse the trend. Not all councillors, I must say, but most. Um, Natasha's given a very good business case for why this could be a good thing. Um, I'd look, like to look at it at a more personal level, a sociological level. When I came to council, um, the council was allowed to rebate owner-occupier residential rates. And I think it used to swing at about 40, 40 ish which was a huge incentive. Mind you, the rates were much higher than the neighbouring suburbs then, so it was worked out on similar suburbs around what their residential rates would be. 
and they were matched by Cook by adjusting the percentage. Now, for some reason, the government thought that this was really advantaging very wealthy people in North Adelaide, forgetting that it was a rebate all across the city and um, brought there for very good reasons. The council before my time looked at the, um, the percentage of owner occupier and rental and found it was dipping below 40%. And they felt that while re renters were very valuable, they tend to be younger, they're transient, they bring a vibe to the city, they really needed a core of people who had put their investment where their, their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and tended to get more involved in the community and um, and so forth because they paid their money and they were going to live there for longer. So the council at the time, I think Bob Angove was a prime mover in those days, thought that there needed to be something because North Adelaide, and this was a North Adelaide-led, um, rightly or wrongly, push, had become a suburb of um, nursing homes and boarding houses and was really just rapid, it reached a decline point, that which they thought was 40%. Um, we found out a couple of years ago that we were dipping around about the 30% owner-occupier and 70% uh, rental, much far worse than, than the time that, um, that the resident, very generous but uh, amazingly successful re rate rebate came in. Uh, this was banned by the government some time ago and we were allowed then to give a small grant, which started at 300. Many said that's piffling, but really to, to, um, to fixed income uh, people, that was very helpful. That was phased out and we were left with nothing. Um, so I, I think this, this is a good thing. Um, I, it doesn't interest me whether it fills up the developer, Chinese developer's big building, but it does interest me that the young people, my daughter's looking for a residential property in, in Melbourne at the moment, and as soon as she gets there, she's faced with a whole line of investor buyers who just blow her out of the water no matter what she does. This will level the playing field to a degree, and I think that uh, obviously it's a good thing. We need to also put in this a raft of keeping our owner occupiers, just 30 seconds, our owner occupiers that already live there um, feeling a little bit more um, uh, protected or encouraged because they already have put their money where their mouth is. They've bought a house and they're living in it. So this, this is good. But it, it has to be, it be followed up by other measures to, to help us maintain our, our very important owner occupier residential population. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Avian. Oh, sorry, Lord Mayor, I'm a bit slow. I'm fasting today, so I haven't eaten. Um, that's right, because it's like the movie theatres. But. Um, I'm a little bit perplexed with this, and the reason I say this is because the stamp duty concession that the state government has provided is only given an incentive to property um, developers to on-sell those properties without the sort of benefit moving on to the people purchasing. So I find some of those discounts without making sure the price in the market is controlled and not increased, because potentially property owners will justify the, well, you're getting 20 grand stamp duty off from the state government or you know, five thousand or ten thousand dollars from the city council. If you pay another ten, you're still better off. Twenty k um, doesn't tend to mobilise the purchase. I mean, the market at the end tends to decide. And if the prices are too expensive for people to buy places in the city, then an incentive of five thousand dollars, which we bank in our case, if an apartment's rates is average a thousand or eight hundred dollars a year, um, etc. Um, I don't know what. I don't know who was just going to uproot and come to the city to save that much money. I think for me, in this um, in this motion, where the anchor is, is the subject to the state government implementing measures of greater values, not even equal values, it's greater values. I see um, no advantage here um, in us pursuing this without the state government obviously putting something in place. So I'm happy to support this, but I'm quite cautious and I probably would prefer to strike the word equal from that motion as an amendment, uh, if I can have a seconder. And I'd like to see a greater value from the state government. I'm happy to vary. Yeah. At least equal. Uh, you, you can't do the variation. You well, can, Councillor Abbey, you, can, you can suggest the variation, then I'll look to the mover and the seconder in the chamber. So we'd like to move that as a proposed variation to remove the word equal and to leave the word greater. Yes? Yes, well, no, I'd like to remove the word 
equal and just okay. you all go I now go to the mover. You've got comfort. I go to the seconder, Councillor Moran. You've got comfort. Yes. I go to the chamber. Chamber, chamber. Have you got comfort about the removal of the word equal? I didn't see. Where is the word equal? It's in the uh, beginning under that before one, uh, Councillor Clarenhan. Oh, okay. Because down on we've, we've clarified it further down. Implement complementary measures. So members, I need to look to you for your comfort. What's being suggested here is that the word equal be removed. That means that the state government will be called upon to provide a greater benefit than what council is. Do I have that comfort from the chamber members? Yeah. I do. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Rabia. So just in speaking to the variation, I'll admit the, the reason it's important is because in land tax and other levers that the state government have, including stamp duty, can give a competitive advantage for the city, especially with the developments. I apologise for the variation. Maybe if I could seek two minutes, Lord Mayor. Members, you got comfort? Yes, you do. Um, yours. Fundamentally, my my biggest problem with this is those levers will only, to some degree, benefit the property market and the developers and being able to sell their properties, maybe a little bit higher offset market, etc. But also, you know, we keep banking on owner occupiers. I mean, I'll be honest. My parents have lived in the same house for the last 15 years, renting. I mean, they're part of the community. They don't own it, they can't afford to own it, they rent a house, but they're still part of the community. So in essence, you know, owner occupier or people that have rented for the last 15 or 20 years, in my eyes, they're just the same people. They're part of the community, they're engaged and they're involved. So if we keep focusing on owner occupier, I don't think that should matter as much. So I've got concerns around that. I've also got concerns around I don't are we providing uh, free rates uh, or free period of rates for commercial buildings that are C and D grade, is that correct? No? And the second option? So again, the other concern I've got is it feels to me that the business community is going to be subsidising this, being that they pay 80% of our rates in the City of Adelaide. How are we incentivising them to be able to you know, occupy their buildings, make sure their buildings are activated. We're not providing any incentive for that. And that is also a concern. Can I clarify that second part of the motion for the benefit of your fellow members, Councillor? Uh, what that is saying is that in the instances where a commercial building is adaptively repurposed into residential, an owner-occupier purchaser of said property or a strata or a unit within it would enjoy, enjoy the same benefit as a as a new build. So for the purpose of the argument, it's being treated as a new build. Look, I would have still like to see this go to a capital city committee meeting where it could be, because these are the type of discussions that need to be had at the capital city committee, where what can we do, what can the state government do, and what we can bring back to council. I think we need to do more than just this, but look, I'm happy to support this in the short term, but we want to see more. Um, yeah, look, I'm happy to move an amendment to refer this motion to a Capital City Committee for discussion. No, 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 just one second. I'm just okay. a motion on the floor. All right. Uh, you'd like to move an amendment for it to be referred to Capital City Committee? For discussion. This exact whole motion, yeah. Uh, members, I would look to a seconder for that. Councillor Clarehan, you'd like to debate. What was that? I'm happy to hear the debate. I don't, yeah, know if I, like to hear the I don't know if there's something I don't know. I need to know. No, members, can I seek leave to speak, Councillor Abiyad? I'm very respectful of the council process. Um, members, uh, Councillor Milani uh, uh, indicated at the beginning that this was being uh, this is uh, being moved uh, on my behalf. Um, members, this is a, uh, a in many ways a product of timing, Councillor Abiyad in as far as is the state government, of course, would be currently uh, contemplating their 17-18 financial year budgets, uh, as we are soon to conclude ours. And I would say we have this unique small window of opportunity members to influence uh, a positive outcome, positive outcome for owner occupiers in the City of Adelaide. What we are uh, putting forth here is largely, if not entirely, predicated on a, now a greater response by the state government. Uh, should this matter be postponed for one, two, three months, my own view is that opportunity in all probability would be lost uh, because of budgetary cycles. Um, this has come out of a conversation with the Deputy Premier uh, and myself, uh, whereby I was saying, look, uh, I think my council chamber would want to see what you're going to do. 
uh, and uh, of course Deputy Premier said, so we'd like to see what you're going to do. I said, well, in that case, I will put this to my council chamber and uh, we will then see what the government reciprocates with. So I think timing, members, is a fairly critical element of what you're debating tonight. Look, having heard that all now, I'm happy to um, I'm happy to withdraw my moving of a deferral to Capital City, provided my second is happy to accept that as well. Um, we're, in all, we're in your hands, Lord Mayor. We trust, we trust your judgment. Happy to give this a go, but I have some serious concerns about the mechanics of it, so I'm hoping this council will get to see it again pending state government's um, decision. Thank you, uh, Councillor Aviard. Members, just to seek your comfort that Councillor Aviard is withdrawing that matter. I have it. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, members, try any DLM and then Councillor Wilkins. Um, Lord Mayor, I, um, I support this, but I'd also like to move a small amendment, and that is to include in paragraph one, um, after the word council implement, comma, for a period of 24 months, comma. No. So, um, I'm not suggesting that we don't give them the five year rate rebate. I'm suggesting that the offer is on the table for two years only. So if I can get a second done, I'll speak, speak to Okay, so Councillor Slam has got his hand up to second you on that. So I presume, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, that would be two years from implementation of the yeah, policy, whatever that years. may happen, and the yeah. CEO. So it may not happen, if, obviously, if the, if the state government isn't able to reciprocate. If it does happen and the, 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 we have a start date, my, um, the purpose of my amendment is to make sure that this is not an open-ended offer for the rest of our lives. We're not going to be doing this, but also to provide a sense of urgency. We, what we're trying to do is stimulate some activity. So we, we need to say to people, if you want to take this offer up, if you want to take this opportunity up, you need to do it now. We've got 24 months to get it done. DLM, can you look at the wording on your screen, please, given that you're moving an amendment, um, to just seek comfort that that's uh, reflecting? I hope that is. A Council implement for a period of 24 months of mechanism. Yes, it does. So, Councillor Slava, you've seconded the um, uh, proposed amendment. Councillor Slava, do you wish to speak to the proposed amendment? You don't? Members, any discussion or debate about the proposed? I'm now on an amendment, so we need to talk about the amendment. Councillor Bershaw. Um, Lord Mayor, could I uh, perhaps ask Council, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor to add the same to point number two? Yep, yeah, sorry. Yep, so I'll seek the comfort of the seconder of Councillor Slama and we'll look to the chamber again to seek the comfort for that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, members. Okay, members, so do I have any further debate on the amendment? Councillor Abia. I'm just trying to uh, just to understand the intent of Councillor Deputy Lord Mayor Hender. I'm guessing this is just to stimulate the market and showcase that there's only a window of two years for people to take advantage of this opportunity. Is that what your intent is? That's fine. That's correct. Yep. Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, on, on the amendment, um, when the, uh, uh, I think, I've got my reservations about how beneficial or impact this whole thing that Councillor Aviat's earlier words were. But um, uh, in terms of just giving a finite date for the opportunity, I think is is important if this, this is to be offered as as a as a stimulus. Um, and if you look at the Lacornia site where a much bigger improvement was given, but with no time frame. All that was done with the land banking exercise that ratcheted up the value probably made it even less likely to get redeveloped. So, so if this is intended truly to stimulate people to sort of up, up roots and move into the city, to live into the city, which is the gist of it, then that, that two year window I think is, is critical to having that effect. Thank you, Council. Members, I might speak briefly to the amendment if I could, and then I'll hand to Councillor Clare, and then I'll hand back to the DLM. Um, I entirely uh, support the idea of a notion of a time limit on this. It is an economic stimulus, that's what it is. It is to drive more owner occupation, and there needs to be a sense of urgency. And further, I think that would actually motivate the government to be more um, uh, pointed in terms of how they provide a complementary stimulus package. I think it must have a time limit on it. I think it's a very good notion. Councillor Clarehan and then Councillor Cor Bell. 
Look, um, I think this is a, a terrific uh, incentive. Um, I think that, uh, it, as has been mentioned, um, with the two-year two time limit, uh, this will really get people thinking quite seriously and will, in a way, incentivise them to, to commit sooner rather than later. And uh, I think, you know, it's been said that, um, I remember when I took out my first mortgage, people used to say, well, look, if you can survive the first five years, you'll be fine. Uh, and, it, and it really was that way. Uh, you know, if you could actually manage to pay off your first mortgage uh, through those first five years, suddenly it became not such a huge impost on your, on your income and lifestyle. And I think if we can combine uh, a rate-free uh, uh, incentive for the first five years, combined with the potential for a state government uh, incentive or incentives that should really have a very positive impact, not just on the development, but basically on uh, a commitment of people to think seriously about moving into the city. Uh, I think it's a very sustainable way of looking at um, the population of our city. I mean, we do have a very movable population. Um, because of the number of students, for example, that we have living in the city, uh, and to get a little bit of buy-in, and especially for people thinking about downsizing, for pe those um, um, people who have a great desire to live closer to work, and I think we've spoken before about those people on lower incomes in, who work in retail and hospitality, um, this, would, this could actually make it possible uh, for them to survive those first five hard years so that they are actually home and housed. And uh, so I, I think uh, this is certainly worth pursuing and I do hope that the state government will come to the party and join us in incentivising people to, to think seriously about committing to living in the city and owning their own home. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Councillor Corbell. Thank you. I might just start by asking a couple of questions of the administration. Um, the first one is, um, if an owner-occupier was to sell their property within this five-year period, say a year or two years after their purchase, and another homeowner-occupier um, was intending to move in, would that then be able to be passed on so that the the rate waiver would be passed on to the new homeowner occupiers? See you. Um, Steve Matheson, thanks. Um, through you, Lord Mayor. The, obviously, the, the resolution passes on to building some of this detail going forward, subject to Council's policy um, decision tonight. Uh, the um, discussions today would be no, that wouldn't be passed on. This is very much an incentive around buying off plan and new dwellings and, and sponsoring the um, the modifications to the Class C and D buildings as well from a commercial perspective. So at this stage, you weren't envisaging that that would be passed from one owner occupied to another. It would be an incentivisation approach. Okay. And my other question was around um, short-term letting type businesses or home businesses. Would they receive the same, like Airbnb as an example, or stays, um, who might be temporarily letting out their entire premises or just a few rooms of their home um, up for um, visitors? Would they receive the same rebate? Would there be any loopholes there or even home-based businesses? That's a level of detail I think we'd need to explore a bit further in the discussions on this. I'm, I'm not in a position yet to have thought through on that example. Okay. Well, I won't, I won't really talk much about this other, other than to say that I think it's really good that we're looking at um, using a lever to stimulate city growth. We're looking at a target of 28,000 people by 2020 and um, increasing the number of people that will be purchasing in the city being homeowner occupiers. This is a lever that we have control over. And um, being a homeowner occupier myself, I previously benefited from um, a, wait, a rate waiver when I entered my premises at Ergo back in 2013. And that was so beneficial. Even just a few hundred dollars extra in your pocket is money that you weren't necessarily expecting. I wasn't expecting it at the time. Whereas these um, lucky homeowner occupiers will be able to benefit from that and budget for it. And that's money that they can spend on whatever they wish, which could then flow into around the city, purchasing um, you know, food and drinks, attending events, 
possible furniture, who knows? So I think it's there's a good flow on effect. Thank you, Councillor Corbell. So, Member, do I have any further debate about the amendment? In the absence of, I'm going to hand you back to the DLM. Sums up. So, Members, we're now uh, treating the motion as amended. So, those in favour? Those against? We carry. Members, do I have any debate on the substantive? I will go to Councillor Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as somebody who does 70% of their work as residential property development, I'm talking to development clients all the time, pretty cognizant about what motivates people to buy or not to buy. And I can say pretty much hard or hand on heart that um, a five year rate holiday is, uh, might be a nice idea to be able to sort of help with marketing and stuff like that. But in reality, when people are making a decision about buying a uh, a $350,000, $400,000, $500,000, $600,000 apartment, then it's not going to weigh into their consideration as to whether they buy into the city or not. Um, but, you know, it's got some feel-good aspects to it. Um, the, um, uh, I'm pleased that it's targeted towards own occupiers. And I know from somebody who lives in Gilbert Street, who, whose house looks out to the new apartments, They've observed that only about 60% um, at most of the lights are on in the building. It's long completed. That means 40% of that building is empty. And what's happened is Melbourne, a whole lot of apartment buildings have been built and money has been made by getting big approvals, much bigger and with more square than maybe ought to be allowed. Um, and then people just buying it and then just sitting on it and not even not even trying to rent the property out. So do we do we want to increase the city population? We want to be, or do we just want more bigger buildings that a few, a few, a small number of people make a lot of money out of building? I feel for those people, uh, the councillor Antics constituents there in Wright Court. You know, who who would want to live in one of those cottages with that looming loom behind you? And I think really what we and state government particularly need to think about is what's going to attract people to live in the city is the prospect of living in the city is a positive experience, not one where you're living in, in, in conditions where you, you wouldn't want to live and um, because of inappropriate developments, canyon-like developments and things like that. So um, we're a European-style city, we should be looking at being a European-scale city and getting that right, I think, is more likely to attract people into the city than, than uh, aspiring for a small number of um, really high high rise buildings like the city more square. That's not going to be attracting people in the city and, and the observation from the view is that forty percent of the building is empty. So all that doing is attracting investors and they're not residents. Mm -hmm. and half the building is empty. So um, I think we need to see what's from the brown trees. Thank you. Members, before I put you back to Councillor Milani to sum up, I might just say a very brief word. Um, that uh, a, a very, very good debate. Um, this is a uh, stimulus, if not incentive, for people with their principal place of residence. So I'd actually like to acknowledge Councillor Moran and Councillor Clarahan, who have both many times, and I think for many years, been advocates, very strong advocates, of the getting the ratio right in the City of Adelaide in terms of voter occupiers. So thank you, Councillor. Um, and I think the strength of this motion lies in how it is reciprocated, as Councillor Aviard said, by the state government. That would be very, very important because on its own it will assist, but it may not catalyse. So uh, combined with incentives from the state, I think we might see some uh, true benefit. Councillor Maloney. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, that was a really good um, conversation and, and insight from everyone. What I like about this motion, and as I said, Lord Mayor, you've, you've driven this, is that it sort of covers the interests of many. We've talked about, you know, for Council Moran, about the grassroots, you know, perspective. Um, we're looking at population growth, um, stimulating the economy. It really does, um, you know, tick a lot of boxes. And picking up on, um, I think what we all agree is the key word is balanced mix. So there's own occupiers mixing with rental, mixing with investment, but we want to um, incentivise this one particular 
a very important part of the uh, group of residents that live in our city. It is calling for the state government. It's time for them to, you know, um, come to the table, it, it, financial incentives, but also it might be legislative um, changes as well, uh, or even advocating for federal government legislative changes, because we know some of the barriers to upgrading and convert, adapting C and D grade building stock to residential has some barriers to it. So we really need to get our hands dirty and come up with a whole range of levers this, this won't stand alone, but as a package, it could actually really drive um, people to come and, and live in the city. So, um, members, thanks for your contribution and thanks, Lord Mayor, and let's see what comes out of it. Members, I put this before you. Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Thank you for the debate, members. Members, item 15.5 we've already dealt with, so I now go to item 17, because item 16 was the duplication. We've got exclusions to the public. Members, I need motions for three matters to be to be considered an exclusion. 18.2.1, which is a Q3 business operations report. Can I have a mover to move that into confidence? Councillor Clearahand, seconded by Councillor Slama. No debate. Those in favour? Thank you, members. We carry. Members, item 18.2.2, .2, which is quarterly open confidential council decision update. To move that into confidence, can I have a mover, Councillor Antic, seconded by Councillor Slama. Any debate members? Those in favour? Those against? We carry. Members, item 18.2.3, which is a new item, confidential business case. Can I have a mover please, members? Councillor Antic, seconded by Councillor Clearham. Any debate members? Those in favour? Those against? We carry. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you are not uh, critical to the uh, following matters, can I kindly ask you to leave the chamber and thank you very much for your attendance.
that a member moves a motion to maintain the video, rec the tape recording in confidence. <laughs> it's done. For what period? Maintain, we, how we maintain For what period? Reality on that. Okay, so the tape recording will be held in confidence until the 30th of April 2024. Thank you, Judy. So, members, before you leave, we need to open the council chamber. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Clarehan. Thank you. So I now formally declare the meeting closed as at uh, 9.34 on Tuesday the 30th of May 2017. Thank you, members.